If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And today's episode focuses on Jennifer Kessie. A very daunting case. Very daunting, very frustrating, and very emotional. I mean, a lot of missing persons cases are, of course, emotional and daunting and frustrating. But there's something about this one that just seems so unnecessary and just not very well followed up on in during the most critical moments and we will be examining all of that including new information this has been a requested case from a patron of course our patrons do get priority on case topic co-podcaster requests and you can check us out on Patreon. Also, if you enjoy the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the podcast, hit the like button. Share it on social media platforms. Keep awareness up on cold cases and missing persons. And you could also check us out on Facebook, Reddit, and Twitter. Questions, comments, thoughts, theories, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings, leave them in the comments section. All right, so this case isn't incredibly old. And this is another one of these super frustrating cases where a person of interest is caught on camera, but nothing comes of it. Uh, His face is not captured, unlike in the Delphi case, which if you haven't checked out the Mind Shock episodes on the Delphi case, check those out. We go into comprehensive and logical analysis of everything that those cases entail and everything that case entails, and that's what we'll be doing here as well for the Jennifer Kessie case. She went missing January 23rd, 2006. This is not forever ago. This is relatively recent, and there are just no excuses for how poorly this investigation was handled from the outset. And new information sheds light on this as well. So she was 24 years old at the time of her abduction. And this is the Orlando, Florida area. Shortly after she vanished, her car was discovered approximately one mile from her home. A local security camera recorded a person who could not be identified parking Kessie's car and walking away. The case received local and national press attention. This will just be the quick wiki overview and then we'll be going into the nitty gritty. So yet another case where a missing person has their vehicle disposed of in some fashion. Is this Shades of Maura Murray? I don't know. So, according to this wiki, the prior events entailed Cassie, who was a graduate of Vivian Gaither High School in Tampa, Florida, attended University of Central Florida in Orlando and graduated in 2003 with a degree in finance. At the time of her disappearance, she was working as a finance manager at Central Florida Investments Timeshare Company in Ocoee and had recently bought a condominium home in Orlando. The weekend before she vanished, Kessie had vacationed with her boyfriend on St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Returning on the Sunday, she stayed that night at her boyfriend's home and then drove straight to work on the morning of Monday, January 23rd, 2006. Cassie was seen for the last time leaving work at approximately 6 p.m. on January 23rd, 2006. She spoke by phone with her father while driving home at around 6.15 and then with her boyfriend at around 10 p.m. She was in the habit of texting or telephoning her boyfriend before leaving for work So it was unusual when she did neither the next morning. His call to her went to voicemail. And we will be examining these critical factors after we do the overview. When Kessie failed to arrive at work, her employer contacted her parents who began the two hour drive from their home to hers. 
And see, th this is handled an interesting way because the employer was concerned because it was not like her to no show, and her parents were concerned because it was not like her to no show. So they're immediately worried and stressed from the get go. And of course, these are the critical hours. Her parents noticed that her car was missing, but saw nothing out of the ordinary in her home. A wet towel and clothes laid out, among other things, suggested that she had showered, dressed, and prepared for work that morning. I wonder how they know that exactly and how that would differentiate from her nightly routine. But if they know the specifics, they know the specifics. Friends and family distributed flyers about Kessie that evening, and the Orlando Police Department organized search parties on foot and on horseback, as well as by boat, helicopter, car, and ATV. And this is the timeline. Approximate and based on witness statements. Monday, January 23rd, 2006, 6 p.m., Kessie leaves work, calls her parents. Last time her family hears from her. She arrives home for the first time since having left for vacation. 10 p.m., Kessie and her boyfriend talk by phone, say their good nights. He is the last known person to speak with her before her disappearance. Tuesday, January 24th, 2006, between 7.30 and 8 a.m., Investigators initially believed that Kessie was abducted as she was walking from her front door to her car. They now believe that she left and was abducted at some point on her way to work. 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., Kessie's boyfriend, who normally would have heard from her, calls her on the way to work, but it goes directly to voicemail. He chalks it up to a meeting she had mentioned to him. His subsequent attempts are likewise unsuccessful. Kessie's parents call him to say that she had failed to show up at work. 11 a.m. Alarmed at Kessie's uncharacteristic no-call, no-show, her employer contacts her parents, who begin the drive from Tampa to Orlando. On the way, they call to ask the manager of her condominium to check her home with a spare key. He reports that everything appears normal inside and that her car is missing outside. 12 noon, only 1.2 miles from Kessie's home, surveillance cameras at an apartment complex record a person in the act of parking her car and walking away. The car and footage are not discovered until two days later. Between 3 p.m. through 15 p.m., Kessie's parents and brother arrive at her apartment. They find evidence that she had been home that morning. They call the police. As Kessie is an adult, police initially hold that she may have left of her own volition. And of course, this is something that's really, really problematic in a lot of missing persons cases. Because on one hand, the police doesn't want to devote all these time and resources when a large percentage of the time, adults and even teens or even minors, if they run away briefly, most of the time they come back. So a search that takes all, these time and, all this time and resources, in their view, that might be unrealistic to have that full-scale response for every single time this kind of scenario unfolds because it, it seems to happen quite often. On the other hand, what are the taxpayers paying for? Because a lot of cases, they could have potentially been solved if they had that full-scale response immediately. And this is, of course, something that people argue for and against. Between 5 and 7 p.m., family and friends saturate the area with flyers that show Kessie's picture. The police send a detective to her home and begin interrogations and searches. Thursday, January 26, 2006, 8.10 a.m., seeing Kessie's car in the news, a tenant of a nearby co complex informs the police that it has sat abandoned in front of their apartment for several days. Police confirm that it is Kessie's 2004 Chevy Malibu. The vehicle is photographed and taken for forensic examination. Police examine local surveillance footage and discover an unidentified person parking her car and walking away. 
And so I believe they only found a partial print, effectively useless, and some kind of trace DNA that was also basically useless because it was very, very low amount. Uh, that leads some to believe that someone had experience with this, but of course that's not necessarily true because if it's someone that just watches a lot of true crime shows, they could have wiped it down, whatever. Uh, that's obviously all speculation. All right, let's go to the investigation. The person of interest who parked Cassie's car was captured by a surveillance camera that snapped a photo once every three seconds. To the dismay of investigators, all three captures of the subject in frame had the suspect's face obscured by the fencing. And just, I mean, it's grainy. It's not that great footage. Even if you could see a partial view of his face from that angle at that resolution, I mean, I don't know. A lot of people are frustrating saying, damn those fence posts. But I'm not sure it would be that much more helpful even if you had that side angle in low resolution. I mean, in the Delphi case, you have a full-on shot of the guy's face. When it's grainy footage, it's just very, very difficult. So obviously it would be better, but I don't think that automatically means they would be able to identify the guy. But With no sign of forced entry or struggle, investigators initially theorized that on the morning of January 24th, Kessie left her apartment for work and locked her front door, only to be abducted at some point while walking toward or getting into her car. And of course, this is mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. I will be examining theories where she could have been abducted inside the apartment and why it appeared why there was no struggle because there was no struggle and we will be getting into a lot of mind shocks because this is a very, very mind shocking case and a lot of new information has come to light in the past year or two which is good because it moves the investigation forward. So that's the importance of keeping awareness up in a lot of these old cold cases. On January 26, around 8, 10 a.m., her black 2004 Chevy Malibu was found parked at another apartment complex about a mile from her own. Investigators were excited to learn that several hidden cameras at the apartment surveilled the part of the lot where the car had been parked as well as the exit. The surveillance footage showed an unidentified person of interest dropping Kessie's vehicle off at approximately noon the day she went missing. None of her family or friends recognized the person whose physical features were not clear on the video. Investigators were disheartened to find that the best video capture of this subject in three separate snapshots was obscured by the complex fencing, the posts aligning to conceal the face. One journalist called the suspect the luckiest person of interest ever. And I will reiterate again, at that angle, a partial profile, I don't think that would have been a smoking gun either way. The FBI was called in to help determine the person's size and gender, but could only say that the person stood between 5'3 and 5'5, five five, which is pretty good too. And then you could also look at the video. You can tell that the person is not extremely, is not super, super short or super, super tall and is not extremely overweight. So you can narrow it down a little bit or even extremely muscular. It, it's a relatively small statured individual. NASA also enhanced the video to help identify the suspect. Detectives interpreted the valuables left inside the car to imply that robbery was not a motive in the case. A search dog tracked a scent that led from her parked car back to her apartment complex, prompting detectives to believe that the suspect might have returned to her apartment's parking lot after abandoning the car. No other evidence was found along the route. A forensic examination of the car yielded little in the way of evidence, only a latent print and a small DNA fiber. Investigators deduced that the car had been wiped down. The following items are known to be missing. Her cell phone, her iPod, her keys, her purse, her briefcase, and the outfit she was wearing. Authorities were unable to ping her cell phone, its power remaining off. Her bank account keycard has not been used since her disappearance. 
As is customary, investigators first questioned Kessie's immediate family and close friends to see if any of them could have had a motive to abduct her. Her ex-boyfriend, recently upset and wishing to get back together with her, was also interrogated, but it was concluded that he had nothing to do with her abduction. Her current boyfriend was also questioned, but his alibi checked out, eliminating him as a suspect. At the time of her disappearance, Kessie's condominium complex has been undergoing a major expansion, and many of the laborers on site were non-English speaking. Kessie had told family members on several occasions that the construction workers constantly catcalled, whistled at, and harassed her. Due to the language barrier, investigators were unable to interrogate many of them. See, this, this is already, already, this is just so problematic. They don't have a Spanish-speaking officer or whatever language they spoke that could have interrogated them. Really? In Florida? And they couldn't get one from another department. This is Orlando. This is not the middle of nowhere. I, th this is just mind shocking. Mind shocking. And we will get into all the theories involving the workers. No other leads regarding them were discovered. Detectives then turned their focus to her place of employment and began questioning her co-workers. Her computer was taken for forensic examination. It was learned that a manager where she worked had desired a relationship with her, but that she had refused his advances because she was against workplace relationships. Detectives interviewed him multiple times, but ultimately ruled him out as a suspect. And we'll be getting into details of persons of interest at her workplace as well, but I mean, how many interviews do you need to determine where he was that morning? He was either there or he wasn't. Investigators and Kessie's friends and family remain open to the theory that she fell victim to human trafficking, but consider it less likely than others. In May 2007, Kessie's company, led by David A. Seigel, Siegel, offered a $1 million reward for information leading to her whereabouts. Now, that's a sizable chunk. That's not small change. With a July 4th deadline and the stipulation that she had to be alive. Huh. Why that stipulation? Because if someone knows what happened to her and she's not alive, they wouldn't come forward. I don't know. It was never claimed. A $5,000 reward for information leading to the whereabouts of her remains was available through Central Florida Crime Line. See, that's not a lot. It's either $1 million or $5,000. There's, there's no in the middle. The case received state and national press attention at the time of her disappearance. She is still considered missing and endangered by the Orlando Police Department, FBI, Orlando County Police, FDLE, NCIC, NC, and Interpol. On May 2nd, 2008, the Florida House of Representatives unanimously passed Senate Bill 502, the Jennifer Kessie and Tiffany Sessions Missing Persons Act, to reform how missing persons cases are handled in Florida. As of June 10th, 2010, the FBI has taken the case over from the Orlando Police Department. It did so at the urging of Police Chief Val Demings. Kessie remains on the FBI's most wanted missing list. The latest search for her took place in February 2014 and investigators continue to receive and pursue leads, of which we'll be going over. And you also see this is drastically different than let's say the Maura Murray case, where the FBI's, even though they were initially investigated, they're not invited, but they should definitely take over that case because there's no proof Maura Murray was even in New Hampshire. So we're talking multiple state lines. It's just, it's crazy. But let's focus on Jennifer Kessie here. And... Here's a more detailed write-up from Crimola.com. Jennifer Kessie, what happened to the missing Orlando woman? This is recent. It was posted January 7th, 2019 by Tina Giordanella. On January 4th, on January 24th, 2006, Jennifer Kessie left her Florida apartment to go to work and was never seen or heard from again. It's been 12 long years since her sudden disappearance and the Kessie family is still no closer to finding out what happened to their beloved daughter and sister. What happened to Jennifer Kessie? For Jennifer Kessie, the morning of January 24th, 2006 started off just like any other normal day. She woke up, got ready for work, and headed out the door. 
But from that point on, no one seems to know what happened to her. And even that is speculation, which we'll be getting into. But not even the Orlando Police Department, whose officers have been actively investigating the case for nearly 13 years. So who is Jennifer Cassie and what happened to her? Since her mysterious disappearance, the case has gripped the nation with countless media stories, ongoing police investigations, and even heightened public interest in returning the young woman to her family safe and sound. Keep reading to find out everything you need to know about this missing person's case and how you can help. Who is Jennifer Kessie? Born on May 20th, 1981, Jennifer Joyce Kessie lived in Orlando, Florida at the time of her disappearance. She was born in New Jersey to Drew and Joyce Kessie and has one younger brother named Logan Kessie. The family eventually moved to Florida when she was a, bit, a little bit older. Jennifer attended Vivian Gaither High School in Tampa. She went on to graduate from the University of Central Florida in 2003 with a degree in finance. While in college, Kessie was very well liked and was even a member of the Alpha Delta Pi sorority on campus. She Shortly after graduation, Kessie was able to land her dream job as finance manager at Central Florida Investments Timeshare Company in Ocoee, Florida. Although she was given numerous job offers at the time, she chose to work for Central Florida Investments because she was an intern there during her college years. She was the youngest manager at her new company. She was a huge fan of the Dave Matthews Band and was known for her infectious laughter and amazing sense of humor. Anecdotal evidence from her friends shows that Jennifer Kessie was a great friend and was always ready and willing to drop everything she was doing and helped her loved ones whenever they needed it most. One of Kessie's friends stated that after she'd gone through a painful breakup, she called Jennifer, who lived an hour away. Kessie drove to her house immediately and brought her chocolate, other snacks, and small gift items and even spent the night with her to help cheer her up. Cassie, who was just 24 years old at the time of her disappearance, had recently purchased a condo at Mosaic at Millennia, a condo complex located on Conroy Road in Orlando. It's safe to say that Cassie was full of ambition and had a very bright, promising future ahead of her. So what went wrong? The events leading up to Jennifer's disappearance. A little known fact about Jennifer Cassie is that she was fluent in in Spanish. Not only could she speak the language, but she could also understand it very well. This fluency came in handy after she moved into her brand new condo. The condo complex was undergoing extensive construction around the time she moved there in November 2005. The project was ongoing for months afterward, even during the time of her disappearance. The construction company reportedly had hired mostly undocumented workers from Mexico many of whom would reportedly make derogatory and sexual remarks about her every time Kessie would walk past them. Unbeknownst to them, she understood every word of what they were saying and complained about the sexual harassment frequently to her family. Due to the extensive construction that was going on, many of the units in the complex, including her building, were unoccupied. Cassie suspected many of the construction workers were even temporarily living in the unoccupied condo units so they wouldn't have to commute to work every day. The young woman was always aware of her surroundings and having to deal with construction workers who would constantly catcall, whistle, and leer at her as she walked by made her incredibly uncomfortable. Her parents instilled a sense of cautiousness in both of their children due to their own experience of being held at gunpoint before Jennifer was born. As a result, Cassie was hyper vigilant. She always carried pepper spray with her and she contacted her loved ones daily to touch base with them. The weekend before Jennifer Cassie was abducted, she went on a brief vacation with her then-boyfriend, Rob Allen, and his family in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The couple, who'd met at a bar and were dating for about a year at the time, appeared to be very much in love. The relationship was so serious that they were allegedly contemplating moving in together. The only problem was that he lived in Fort Lauderdale, which was approximately three and a half hours from where Cassie lived in South Florida. While they were away on vacation, Cassie constantly kept in contact with her family just to tell them about her trip and let them know that she was safe. 
She even asked her father what type of rum he liked so that she could purchase it for him. Jennifer Kessie's younger brother, Logan, stayed in her condo with a few of his friends while she and Rob were away from the weekend. It's important to note that Kessie left her pepper spray behind in her condo while on vacation because she knew it would be confiscated by airport security, which is kind of messed up. I mean, can you really use pepper spray to, uh, to hijack a plane? On the other hand, you're going to leave this woman defenseless at whatever she's, wherever she's traveling to or having the added burden of having to purchase pepper spray at that location. That, that's pretty weird. All right. Upon arriving back in Miami on Sunday, January 22nd, a friend of Allen's drove the couple to his home in Fort Lauderdale where Jennifer spent the night. The next day, she drove directly to work from Allen's house. By all accounts, this was not out of the ordinary for the then 24-year-old. Monday, January 23rd, 2006, Kessie arrived at work in good spirits and was excited to tell her co-workers about her weekend getaway. She was last seen leaving work at 6 p.m. that evening and even had a brief conversation with her boss before she left. When Kessie got home, she called her parents, as she did every evening, and had a short talk with them. The last person she spoke to on the phone the night before her abduction was Rob Allen. She would called him around 10 p.m. before they both said goodnight and went to bed the day Jennifer went missing. Again, Tuesday, January 24th, 2006, seemed to start just like any other day for Jennifer Kessie. Presumably, she woke up in the morning, took a shower, did her hair, put on her makeup, got dressed for work, and headed out the door. Presumably, indeed. Except no one seems to know exactly what happened to her between the time she exited her condo and walked to her car, if indeed that's what happened. If indeed that's what happened, because we are gonna go over witness accounts uh, there's even a witness who actually saw her car driving erratically from the from the complex. And also, we will examine exactly where she could have been abducted, abducted from, and is it really a given that she exited the apartment on her own accord? Kessie was never one to not call in sick or be late to work when she failed to show up at all and missed a very important meeting scheduled for 11 a.m., her co-workers knew something was amiss. That's when they called Kessie's parents to let them know that their daughter never arrived at work that morning. Immediately, the Kessies called the building manager at Jennifer's condo complex and asked him to check in on her. He told them nothing seemed out of the ordinary, that she wasn't there, and her car was also missing. They also tried calling Jennifer's cell phone directly, but it kept going to voicemail which was odd because she never turned her phone off or let the battery die. The Kessie family made the two-hour trip over to Jennifer's condo and was granted access to her apartment by the building manager. Upon entering the unit, they quickly noted that everything looked normal. Her bed looked like it had been slept in, and her shower was still wet from when she used it earlier that morning. Everything seemed to be just as she would have left it. Evan Allen, who was accustomed to getting either a phone call or text from Kessie during his morning commute to work, didn't hear from her at all that day. He tried calling her cell phone throughout the day, but it just kept going directly to voicemail. That's when he knew something was wrong because she always had her phone on her person. While he was worried about her, he also just assumed that she was busy with work because she had that very big meeting at work that day. Logan and his friend Travis, who was one of the people staying at Jennifer Kessie's condo while she was away and had left his work phone there over the weekend, arrived at the condo to scope out the area around 3 p.m. Drew and Joyce Kessie arrived at the condo around 3.15 p.m. They noticed everything was clean and tidy and there was no sign of forced entry, which indicates that their daughter either knew her abductor or was abducted after leaving her condo that morning, assuming she was abducted, of course. And I have to add in a Bruce McGuire aside here because not necessarily. If the building manager has the key, who knows who else could have the key? If someone else had the key, then there would be no forced entry, would there? Or if she was in the middle of opening the door to leave when someone abducted her, either putting, pushing her back into the apartment or otherwise. Assuming she was abducted, of course. Jennifer's family contacted the Orlando Police Department to file a missing persons report, but when they arrived on the scene, they initially dismissed the case. 
Officers believe that Jennifer was probably upset because she got into a minor argument with her boyfriend over the phone the night before and that she would turn up. Her family, on the other hand, knew there was much more to the story. The Kessies immediately took matters into their own hands and started rallying Jennifer's friends and loved ones, including Rob Allen, to hand out missing persons flyers with Jennifer's picture to people throughout the area. Two days after her mysterious disappearance, Kessie's car, 2003 Black Chevy Malibu, was located in an apartment complex about one mile away from where she lived. After securing no leads, in this case, police were excited to learn that the apartment complex had a security system in place. Unfortunately, they also quickly realized that the surveillance system didn't record video, but merely took snapshots of the surrounding area. They uncovered three snapshots of a potential suspect or person of interest who was seen parking the vehicle outside of the apartment complex. However, the person's face was completely covered by the bars of the security gate outside of the building in all three images. This effectively made it impossible for the OPD and the FBI, who would later get involved in the case, to identify the person of interest over a decade later. Even NASA was called on by investigators to try and enhance the images for a clearer reading, but that effort proved unsuccessful, prompting one reporter to call the person in the pictures the luckiest person of interest ever. A few notable items that were reported missing from Jennifer's condo were also missing from her car iPod, purse, keys, briefcase, clothes she had on that day. However, these are all things she had on her person and were probably taken with her. It's also worth noting that Kessie had several valuable items in her vehicle. And this leads people to believe that obviously it wasn't a carjacking or a robbery with all the valuable items left. So here's a really, really big mind shock. I haven't heard this detail revealed on most media um, on most media handling the case and this might be critical so on the oxygen show regarding the case her brother said when he got to the apartment to look for his sister he saw a big white van there he would knocked on the video on the window of the van asking if they had seen jennifer and they flat out ignored him. He said other guys got in his face and were intimidating him. So those are the feelings of Logan Kessie, her brother, that some of these workers may have had something to do with Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, especially the way they behaved towards him, which I have to agree, this is very, very suspicious and damning in their direction from the guys in a white van completely ignoring him to other workers intimidating him and, and this manager intimidating him yeah this is definitely not the apartment complex you would want to stay out even if you were a man let alone a young woman this is just not yeah this does not seem like a safe environment with safe people especially if these workers are actually sleeping and staying in apartments so if someone's connected to the manager who has the key, I mean, he said construction manager, not apartment manager, so we'll have to narrow down all these individuals, but could they have gotten a key to her place or possibly even stolen it without the, uh, the particular manager knowing? Who knows? If they had a thing for her, which, I mean, maybe they harass every woman they see. We don't know. Uh, it's possible, depending on what kind of people they are, or if they just had a particular fixation towards her and not other females at the complex. So, of course, we're going back, circling back to the investigation. They didn't have a single police officer who spoke Spanish. I mean, I mean, really? This, this is just, this hurts the brain. This hurts the brain because all of those people should have obviously been checked out, especially with her history of complaints against these particular individuals who made comments specifically to her. And of course, if we look at FBI statistics, most missing persons or women who have met with foul play, it's usually, if it, it's usually the boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or husband or ex-husband, or it's someone she knows. Not necessarily a friend, but someone who is known to her, not a stranger who had never seen her prior. So, very, very bizarre. Some people think that the POI in the security footage kind of looks like a painter. I don't know. I don't know. 
Here's a really good comment from uh, a Redditor examining this case. One thing that has always bothered me was the timing of her abduction. By this, I mean relative to what was happening in her life at the time. She had just returned from the Caribbean. She went straight to work from her boyfriend's place. Did not actually return to her condo until the evening of her last contact. I would think if some stranger was stalking her with ill intent, the sudden whirlwind of changes to her schedule would throw them way off. Not only did she disappear for a few days, but, she, but suddenly a couple of guys were hanging out there. Whoever did this knew she was going to be home that night morning, and most importantly, knew she'd be alone. I don't know if her ex had anything to do with it, but I will say there are some bizarre circumstances tying him to all of this. He was across the street that night of last contact, and he stayed at her condo while she was away. All of these circumstances raise suspicion at the very least. I don't know if that's corroborated. There were also comments made at her workplace by certain individuals. The other thing that's really strange, of course, is the manner of what went on here. So was she abducted by, for example, a white in a white construction van possibly and taken somewhere else while a different perp or accomplice got rid of the vehicle or was it just one person acting alone that took her somewhere else let's say in a white van and then came back and moved her vehicle this is all all quite strange also how come this person this POI that parked the car and her keys weren't recovered so he, he kept the keys the car was parked the keys were kept Nobody, and it's a 1.2 mile walk. So there's no surveillance cameras anywhere else along that route? I mean, I don't know. I would hope that would be nailed down because that's, uh, yeah. And I, I bring this up all the time, but what about satellite footage? I mean, we're looking at 2006 here. What about like all of the NSA's top secret satellite programs? They, they, could, they should have some footage from satellites or some kind of, some kind of footage. Not necessarily enough to, to maybe make out somebody's face, but logistics. You could see a figure leave the apartment, get into the car, wh or whatever, where they walked. I bring that up a lot, but yeah, there needs to be some kind of new agency formed specifically for cold cases, some kind of federal agency that has access to all, all satellite footage at all times. So here's another mind shock, and I don't know what to think of this one. So she's on the phone... And she said her neighbor knocked on the door, but she ignored it and didn't answer. So I don't know if any more information is available beyond that, but what would the neighbor want? I mean, I guess the neighbor might have noticed that, or and was she definitively able to verify that was a neighbor? So did she look through? Did she look through the? Did she look through and see that it was the neighbor? Or did she just assume it was the neighbor? And what did they want? That's kind of bizarre. It's kind of bizarre. Now, the other thing we have to consider with the neighbor and also this phone call, supposedly her phone was powered down at 10.40 p.m. And the family says she never turns the phone off. So why would it have been powered at 10.40 p.m.? Some people believe the, abdu the abduction did indeed happen at night. <sighs> some other interesting things. Some light is shed on some other interesting things. This is an article by Brenda Thornlow, November 2nd, 2017, on Medium.com, What Happened to Jennifer Kessie. In this article, she notes that the Orlando police never processed Jennifer's condo as a crime scene. So there could have potentially been evidence there if it was staged or whatnot. We don't know. Or if even another worker had possibly, with a key, had gone in there at a different time, even if they didn't have anything to do with uh, her disappearance. I mean, this is all unknown. So it also mentions this Drew Kessie mentioned in his interview 
on the unconcluded podcast that she was on the phone the night of the, while she was on the phone the night of the 23rd, someone knocked on her door and she chose not to answer. She claimed that it was one of the neighbors, but to this day, the person on the other side of the door is unknown. So, yeah, this is problematic. This is problematic. Her ex-boyfriend was around the corner at a bar that night as well. Did he stop by? I don't know. This is all very, very bizarre, and I think anybody dismissing any of these anomalies, so to speak, or, uh, or just loose ends, is, 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 it's just strange. Because it's also strange her reaction. So if she claimed it was one of her neighbors just offhand, oh, it's probably just one of the neighbors, refused to answer. This is someone trying to make contact with her. Possibly the last person trying to make physical contact with her. Who knows who this person was? And so to this day, the person on the other side of the door is unknown, according to this article. So it's not her. It's not necessarily the neighbor. They never came forth. So whoever knocked on her door the night before when she's never seen again has not been identified. Why is this not being talked about more? This is mind shocking. Drew Kessie also speaks of how one day while on the phone with Jennifer, there were a couple of workers at her place doing touch-up work on a paint job. Jennifer took the time during her lunch break to drive home to unlock the door and stand by while the workers did their job as she refused to allow anyone inside her home while she was out. As she kept an eye on these workers for additional safety measures, she spoke with her father over the phone. Drew was able to hear the workers in the background and noted that they spoke no English. Jennifer even attempted to communicate with them, but they were unable to comprehend, which is kind of weird because isn't she fluent in Spanish? I, I don't understand this. Several years later, Drew would discover that one of these workers had been arrested and thrown in jail. For what type of crime, I'm unsure. It was discovered that this person worked at Mosaic during the renovation period. He was asked during questioning whether or not he had ever been in contact with Jennifer. According to Drew, this person claimed that, yes, he knew who she was. She was a nice girl, and the last time he saw her, she told him and his coworkers to lock up before they left. Anyone who knows Jennifer knows this cannot be true. Did this person have a reason to lie about Jennifer leaving him her key or a copy of her key? Could he have confused her with another resident? Could the language barrier be to blame? While Jennifer's boyfriend Robert was cleared as a suspect, it is widely known that Jennifer's ex-boyfriend Matt was at a bar called Blue Martini located across the street from her complex. Rumors abound that he was still in love with Jennifer and wanted to reunite with her. The Blue Martini was a popular hangout at the time, so it's not completely unusual that Matt was there with friends. While the Kessie family does not suspect him, and he does have alibis for that night and was at work the following morning, he was never given a polygraph test despite the fact that he agreed to take one. He was simply never contacted after he agreed to do so. And is that just lazy police work? Because, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people aren't the first to volunteer to do a polygraph because they're not even that accurate. So if you fail and you're innocent, that makes you look bad. And if you're innocent and you pass, people will say, oh, well, polygraph tests aren't definitive. So, <laughs> of course, yeah, not a lot of people are willing to take one. So that's quite interesting. Another person that has come under suspicion is a co-worker of Jennifer's. I won't mention his name in this piece, but you will have no trouble finding out to whom I'm referring to. This particular co-worker was very interested in Jennifer and made it well known that he wanted a relationship with her. Jennifer explained to him that she made a rule of, date of not dating co-workers. I'm sure the fact that he was married played into that decision as well. Apparently, this person was very upset to discover that Jennifer had gone on a vacation with her boyfriend and supposedly confronted her about it. In response, Jennifer told this person what a wonderful time she had in St. Croix and that she didn't want to leave. On the day of January 24th, the day Jennifer went missing, this person didn't show up to work until noon. His excuse for being late had to do with a traffic ticket he received. As far as I know, this was never proven. Now, how hard is it to narrow down whether he got a traffic ticket or not? 
I mean, not just traffic cams, but even if there's no traffic cams, wouldn't an officer have a record of this man being given a traffic ticket and at what location and at what time? Now, the first thing that jumps out at me here with this POI is how much would that bruise someone's ego where Jennifer's telling him what, how wonderful of a time she had with her boyfriend literally the day before she's never seen again? Yeah, that's 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 rough. This this entire case is is very daunting. Very very daunting case. No shortage of POIs, no shortage of loose ends. The following day, while talking about Jennifer's disappearance, his response to another coworker named Adam was, "Quote, she's likely eaten up by alligators already." End quote. Interesting thing to say, is it not? In 2010, Adam filed a complaint against this coworker as he began harassing Adam about following up with the FBI on information he provided about Jennifer. Now, before we, I'll get back into the coworker in a moment, but there's another variable here that we have to address because this timeline truly is bizarre because the amount of things that are happening in the 24 hours prior to her disappearance is just astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing in the amount of POIs. But here's another issue, and this is what law enforcement actually focused on. They thought that she was out doing this, and that's why she was missing. So while she's leaving her job, so the day before her disappearance, she's on the phone with her parents at 6.15 p.m., Logan, her brother, chimes in to ask her to FedEx his other friend Travis's phone as he needs it for work. He left his phone at her apartment. So while she was away, her brother and friends were staying at that, at that apartment. Travis happened to forget the phone there. Jen commits to sending it overnight the following day. And she reminds him that she had not been back to the condo to locate it yet. So I just, I don't like coincidences and loose ends. I'm not a coincidence theorist. Obviously, every case on average should have maybe one coincidence at most two. Is this the coincidence in this case where just coincidentally the day she's supposed to send back this phone, she goes missing? How often does someone leave a work phone, an important work phone, in an apartment? So, I don't know. I'm not saying there was something more to it on why it was left there. It's just, isn't it weird how... The day she disappeared, this is what she should have been done, which is an out-of-the-ordinary thing. It's not every day you need to FedEx someone a work cell phone. So that's just bizarre. It's yet another oddity in this case that you just don't know what to do with. Now, this information is actually coming from BlinkOnCrime.com. And there's more information here about other potential... Uh, romantic interests in her life so the fight the semi fight whatever you want to call it that she's having with rob allen her boyfriend is that they were arguing about who would have the easier move if they were going to move in together the other thing this website states is that jen had also been approached by a vendor turned personal friend who was working with her to launch the company's new debit system to consider going out on a romantic date with him. He would have to cool his jets for now. Jennifer told him while they had a business relationship and she was currently in one, there was no chance of anything more. And these are daddy-daughter chats where she's pretty open with her father and she's revealing this information. Jen told Drew that she was having an issue with a coworker who was overly fawning and complimentary, asking her out constantly. Jen asked her dad his thoughts about the concept of just going out to lunch with a person to tell them that you were not interested in them. Was that a kinder option than just saying no, where she stood the risk of an interpersonal situation she did not want? Jen did not disclose that her office admirer was married with children. Drew believes that fact may have raised some necessary red flags for him back then. 
Drew advised Jennifer not to go on any outing that might be perceived as a date, but to agree to lunch and have the conversation in a, lighting, in a lighter setting. That was the best she could do. In a follow-up discussion between the two, Jen told Drew she had done just that, and it went fine. So here's a quote from an OPD detective. She had a fight with her boyfriend. She took off. Happens all the time. She'll be back in a couple of hours. Yep, that's a rough one. That's a rough one, especially if it wasn't exactly a fight. Because if they were just arguing over who would have the easier move if they move in together, I mean, that, that's a pretty common thing. I don't know. Unless it was a little bit more extreme and she was saying that she would have to move on if he wasn't ready to kind of make the next step, which is what's reported here. Also from BlinkOnCrime.com, I told Drew I would absolutely be willing to have my team's resources look into Jen's case, but to be honest, I really didn't believe I could offer any insights as I did not subscribe to the prevailing theory in the case. I have worked on cases before where that has been the situation and found it futile in progressing leads, which is of course the goal. The last thing I want to do is upset the apple cart, and in my mind, this is a personal crime, not a random construction person or landscaper. The odds of Jennifer being abducted by a stranger in broad daylight at that hour in full view of a handful of people in visual proximity carrying her keys and a briefcase at her size and with her physical strength does not jibe for me. It also does not even begin to touch the statistics that agree with my position. I told Drew I really think it is likely someone Jennifer knew. It might be someone she did not know well, or their intention certainly, but everything I have ever reviewed on the case has not excluded the possibility for me. Statistically speaking alone, if this is a homicide case and preliminary, I do believe that is the most likely scenario, there is a greater than 90% chance she knew her killer. Although I have to chime in here, if it is some kind of repeated individual that's a worker there, she would have known him without it being someone personal. It wouldn't be exactly a stranger. She might have even knew the guy's name, possibly. Jen is a low-risk victim for a random and stranger-perpetrated abduction, period. His response to me was crisp. Christina, I do not care about the theories or, who they, or whose they are. I just do not want to go in the ground without knowing what happened to my daughter. If you have a different thought or approach, there is nobody closed off to any possibility. We just want her found. It will be six years of hell, and she deserves to come home. For the last three months, the investigative team at BlinkOnCrime.com has analyzed thousands of documents, conducted numerous interviews of sources both willing and unwilling to discuss her case publicly in conjunction with on-location review. Separating the wheat from the chaff would not come easy, but wheat we found. Random abduction in open stairwell. Despite the fact that there were literally over 100 different workers on site, all of which would have been there by 7 a.m. when the bulk of the workday started for landscapers and contractors, neither saw nor heard anything unusual that morning. In fact, not one person interviewed remembers seeing Jennifer's car that morning upon arrival. Although apparently there was someone who said they saw her vehicle driving erratically out of the complex. I haven't been able to narrow that down yet, but uh, if any listeners know exactly where that original source came from, they can chime in. The door to Jennifer's condo was locked with no sign of forced entry or any sort of scuffle in her home. Dishes in the dishwasher were clean and likely ran by Logan when he left no dishes in the sink. Editors note, if you have not already, run your shower for 15 minutes at the shower her trajectory of a 5 foot 8 inch tall person and keep track of the time you can say with, certainly, with certainty you do not find water droplets. It should be noted, of course, that the assumption continues to be made that it was Jen that actually showered as opposed to someone else. To my knowledge, the only conclusive fact about when Jennifer Kessie was last in her apartment is that she spoke to Rob Allen on her landline to his cell phone at 9.57 p.m. Well, that and her phone was not in it. At 10.40 p.m., when its power source was removed after pinging in a location intentionally being withheld, 
So it's not definitively verified at the location where the phone pinged. So did it not ping at the apartment? I'm assuming it did. If anybody has any info to the contrary, that would be pretty crazy. Jen's condo was equipped with a working intrusion alarm. She had disarmed it because Logan was visiting for the weekend. It was not armed when the family arrived the afternoon she was discovered missing. According to a source inside the management company's servicing Mosaic at the time, they have never been asked to produce any sort of reporting as to its setting by Orlando police. In a conversation with the condo's current owner, those records would no longer be available as of the date of this writing. The ancillary objects pointing to Jennifer sleeping in her condo that night could just as easily reflect that she took a nap, showered, and went out, or was roused from her bed by an unexpected visitor known to her. Jennifer's glasses were located in the bathroom, not next to her bed. Missing from her closet are her favorite taup snake print pumps. Found in Jennifer's hamper was a man's sweater that does not belong to any known male associates of hers and is believed to fit no larger than a medium build individual. That's really bizarre. I don't know why there's no more information here on this, but... Is this been verified that this sweater did not belong to any of her brother's friends that stayed at the at her apartment? That's bizarre. And again, look at the uh, the circumstances leading up to this disappearance are just bizarre. You have her brother and her friend and his friends staying at her apartment with in the twenty four hours leading up to her going missing. You have one of them leaving a phone that she was supposed to locate and FedEx back. You have an unknown individual knocking on her door the night before. Her ex-boyfriend is around the corner that night. The car driving erratically, if that's true, if that sighting is true. I mean, this is just bizarre stuff. This, this is just really, really creepy stuff. Previously thought to be missing, but discovered after being returned to the Cassies by OPD later, years later, was her brown pocketbook she used on her trip. It had been packed in the duffel bag located on the floor in the foyer. There were two workers that had access to work orders inside Jen's condo. Both men were interviewed agreed to take polygraph tests administered by the FBI and were subsequently cleared. The identities of those individuals did not produce any criminal's record, criminal records. To date, Jennifer's keys, wallet, iPod, LG phone, and briefcases are missing. Travis, Travis's phone has never been recovered and pings from his phone confirm it ran out of power over the weekend. So if it has never been recovered, that seems that it's very possible she located the phone, put it in her own briefcase to FedEx, right? Because her own wallet or briefcase or whatever on her person to FedEx it possibly at lunchtime or after work because she had said she would do it that day. Or maybe it points to something else. I don't know. All right, regarding the 2004 Chevy Malibu, Parking spaces were located to the rear of the building, which allowed those familiar with the complex to access the back entrance, which was not enclosed due to the construction. Jennifer used the front entrance the evening when returning from work to pick up her mail on the way in. There was no sign of any foul play in either the exterior or interior of Jen's car. Found on the floor of the front passenger side of her car were the flip-flops she wore home from work that afternoon as well as a pair she wore in St. Croix. Also found were aspirin, her broken mail key, a business card, her sunglasses, and cell charger. Not plugged in and wrapped around the gear shift. A DVD player for her bedroom was given to her by Rob Allen and strapped in with the seat belt was located in the back seat. Huh. 
The Malibu was found locked in the lot of the Huntingdon on the Green Apartments January 26th. It was removed at the request of OPD by a flatbed tow truck prior to CST processing and prior to any assessment as to whether or not it was in working condition or impaired in some way, causing Jen to need assistance. It was, as it was equipped with coded keys, the suspect who parked it had to have Jennifer's original key. Attempting to use a spare would have rendered it inoperable. Drew Kessie was never asked to provide a second coded key in his possession at the home in Bradenton, so it is unclear how OPD was able to gain access and perform any diagnostics. Fatal familiarity. Distrust all those who love you extremely upon a very slight acquaintance and without any visible reason. Lord Chesterfield, this is a quote. Is it ironic that the initial law enforcement theory was that Jen was essentially pitching a fit over a boyfriend, but spent the bulk of early efforts running down the potential illegal alien and day labor du jour angles? The, the usual suspects were easy to clear. Rob's cell was at his home and then work where he was, but he agreed to and passed the polygraph test. Matthew Sullivan and Matt former boyfriend who was so devastated at the news of Jennifer's disappearance, he drank himself senseless for two weeks and was described as inconsolable, cleared. Vendors, cleared. Any and all known male associates, cleared. Astonishingly, it was not until almost three and a half years after Jennifer Cassie disappeared that the first of Jen's co-workers were interviewed. You read that sentence correctly. Connections to completely unassociated cases and abduction by Dubai chic theories were apparently the priority. Apparently, the Liam Neeson blockbuster taken was at least partially inspired on the publicly known aspects of Jen's case as the Kessies received a call from one of the movie's producers. OCOM and the good men and women of OPD assigned to this case are strangers, I fear. In their defense, and I guess also by default, playing the hand they were dealt by the other detectives who apparently had developed their own secret decoder implements without sharing was the wrong kind of flush. As I began my interviews among colleagues of Jen's that, I that would speak to me on the condition of anonymity only, I was repeatedly asked if I spoke to an individual by the name of Johnny. In a subsequent follow-up interview with Drew Kessie, I asked him if he was familiar with that name. Yes, that is the guy I told you about that Jen said was asking her out constantly, and I told her to have lunch with and let him down easy that way instead of a date. I remember because I asked her to repeat his name. I thought it odd for an adult businessman to go by the name Johnny at the office. I can't remember what year, I think it was about two years ago, Joyce and I were at one of our sponsored events at the mall and he introduced himself. I said he introduced himself to you? Not to me, I was talking, but I saw him. He walked up to Joyce and said that he had worked with Jen and that before she went missing, the office had a secret Santa exchange where he got her name. I said, didn't OPD secure the things from her cube? He answered, I have no idea. He just said she kept it on her desk and he thought we should have it. Further interviews and investigation led me to to Johnny's subordinate who knew both Johnny and Jennifer Kessie. In fact, he was stationed in the cubicle next to Jen and what, and what I learned next will undoubtedly be the WTF moment in this case. Because of the open investigation and his status as a possible material witness, I will refer to him as Adam Frank, which is not his real name. Frank's statements to me have in, been independently verified through multiple sources or you would not be reading them here. Adam had been working for Central Florida Investments for eight years before being fired for asking his bosses to investigate the alleged harassment perpetrated against him by his supervisor, Johnny, since the day Jennifer Kessie disappeared. He believed it was because he knew specifics about them, 
and for what he told Orlando police and subsequently the FBI, which was corroborated by the polygraph he requested to take. So he was the one who he requested to take it to prove what he was saying was true. This is all very, very mind shocking. And does that point the finger? He was fired for asking his bosses to investigate harassment by a guy. But a harassment which started the day Jennifer Cassidy disappeared. And the bosses fired the guy calling for the investigation. Wow, this is the guy that was stationed in the cubicle next to Jennifer Cassie. And this is the same company that immediately called her parents, that did all these things, put up a million dollars. I don't understand unless, and this guy passed the polygraph, so I don't know. He needs a brain fingerprint scan, of course. It's a lot more accurate, but after his supervisors had met with OPD weeks later in May 2009, Adam Frank received a subpoena served to him at the office in full view of his peers to meet with the FDLE the following week. He told them the following notes from our interview. He was friends with Johnny. One time when he said to Jennifer in an email about work, but wrote at the last line, she looked nice today. Johnny asked him why he would say that to her. Was he interested in her? Adam told him that he was just being nice and asked him how he knew about it in the first place. Johnny ignored the question. On another occasion, he had walked past Johnny and Jen in the hallway and they were laughing. He thought it was about him because of the email, so he asked them. Both replied absolutely no and shared whatever they were laughing about, alleviating Frank's angst. It was short-lived. On Friday, January 20th, upon learning of Jen's impromptu trip with her boyfriend, Johnny was bending Adam's ear like a wannabe jealous boyfriend. Johnny told him that Jen was a jerk for dating that Brit a-hole and other fill-in-the-blank derogatory insults. Adam was uncomfortable and reminded Johnny that Johnny was a married man and he did not want anything to do with the conversation or get in the middle of what was going on. He needed his job. On Monday morning, January 23rd, around 8 a.m., Adam overhears Johnny confront Jen upon her return while in his cubicle, unbeknownst to them. While I have the full statement of what was said between the two, in the interest of preserving case-sensitive information, I will provide a summary. Johnny confronted her about where she was and who she was with. Jen responded that she had a fantastic time, loved it, and hated to leave. Johnny was audibly and visibly perturbed. At no time did either become aware that Adam overheard the exchange. At least not until he met with OPD for the second time in 2009, where they informed Adam that Johnny had been interviewed based on his information. At this time, everything made sense to Adam as to what was going on since the day Jennifer disappeared. Are you guys ready for another mind shot? When Johnny showed up for work around noon on Tuesday, January 24th, Appearing overtly nervous and pacing around, Frank thought he was acting strangely, but it did not escalate to scary until a few hours later where it was learned through the grapevine that Jen Kessie might have been abducted. Johnny is a supervisor and therefore not required to keep a time card. The next day, Wednesday, January 25th, if you can believe it, proved to be even stranger. Johnny asks Adam, to drive the pair to the new Westgate office at Lake Eleanor. Adam thought it bizarre, since it was not either man's responsibility to do such, but agreed. It is not clear if Johnny was without his 2000 blue Ford Taurus that day. On the way, Johnny asked Adam how far his brother lived from there, the one with the vacant apartment next to his, and if they could stop there and ask him if he heard anything? Wow, this is getting more and more mind shocking. During the drive, Johnny told Adam wherever Jen was, quote, she was likely eaten up by alligators already, end quote. Adam asked him not to say such things. Johnny repeated it. Johnny and Adam stopped in at the Lake Eleanor office, said hello to a few colleagues, and headed back. Over the next four years until Adam Frank had the second meeting at his request 
with the FBI in an attempt to further allegations he felt were not being taken seriously by OPD. He claims Johnny harassed him on the job relentlessly. Things were about to get worse. The FBI advised him if he was having problems at work over the issue, he should go to his supervisors. January 19th, 2011, he did. In three subsequent internal meetings with varying levels of seniority, Adam repeated his story about his treatment by his immediate supervisor and concerns for his physical safety if Johnny was involved in what happened to Jennifer Kessie. He finally requested a meeting with this other individual, who I'm guessing is a high-ranking individual of the company, and told him the events he was going through were making him physically ill and asked for his help to review and or expedite his complaint. Three days later, Adam received a call where he was told his issues with Johnny and the Kessie case were not good for the company and he would be terminated effective immediately. At no time was Frank ever told the status or outcome of his complaint against Johnny. Johnny is the only contemporary of Jennifer's to maintain his position to date. Attempts to reach Johnny or the other superior who executed this termination for comment were not returned. Ironically, Adam Frank files a grievance against Johnny five years to the day that Johnny returned to CFI after a short stint in Lake County Jail for ripping up a citation the morning of January 16th. Another coincidence, how many, I mean, the stack is getting up there. Johnny was remanded to Lake County Jail on bond and after his wife posted the required $500 in a brief appearance on the 18th, returned to work on the first day Jennifer Kessie was off likely learning about her departure then. Huh, so he didn't even know ahead of time she was taking the trip, so that would possibly make him even angrier because she never told him about it if, he's an, if he believes in his own mind that he's entitled to know all these things for whatever reason. The only known suspect in the disappearance is the individual that was recorded parking her vehicle. So this is all quite, quite bizarre. I really don't know what to make out of any of this information. I don't know how much of it has been corroborated, but that is what is listed here on Blank on Crime. I mean, how coincidental is that this supervisor ha happens to be late to work that day, coming in at noonish when supposed the day, I don't know, and he was angry about the fact that she went on if that's true that he was angry about it. I mean, I don't know. This whole case just, there's something off about all of it. And I wonder what the FBI has. I mean, obviously, it's very possible the FBI is looking at him and they're just waiting to have something conclusive because they have to have, you know, in order to get the conviction, they can't just go off some hearsay. So they're possibly waiting on something more definitive. I don't know. But just also the way that her brother, Cassie's brother, was treated when he was knocking on the white van, ignored, and then intimidated by other workers, that's definitely strange behavior. I mean, none of this makes any sense. This is real bizarre. And then the, the 24 hours leading up to her disappearance, that's really bizarre as well. And there's actually even more mind shocks to go over. This is definitely a deep, deep case. It did not appear to be that involved on the surface, but we have multiple POIs. Who knocked on her door that night? I mean, that really is the real question. That's the real question. And why? And how often did that happen for her to just dismiss it? And why was she still living there, especially if she was that scared and that uncomfortable with the workers? I mean, I don't know. These are all questions that need to be answered. Hope you enjoyed another edition of Mind Shock True Crime. As always, if you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal to help us put out even more mind shocking episodes. You could check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon, Patrons who get priority for case topic or podcaster requests. And any questions, comments, thoughts, theories, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings, leave them in the comment section. If you like this podcast and to keep up awareness in this case and other cold cases, please share it across social media platforms. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.
you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshock True Crime. You are listening to the Jennifer Cassie series. This is episode two, New Evidence. And there's a lot of new evidence that has come out over the past year or so. And even more confounding evidence that I have not discussed from part one. If you haven't checked out the first episode, make sure you check it out because we go over all of the base theories and the overview, which is a prerequisite for understanding what's going on with this case, and all of the unanswered questions. I mean, this case really is bizarre. If you follow the Maura Murray and the Delphi cases that are covered on Mindshock, there's just endless coincidences and anomalies, and the Jennifer Kessie case has a fair bit of those as well. It's just a very unusual situation, and just a mind-shocking amount of variables that are out of the ordinary leading up to Jennifer Cassie's disappearance. So we'll be examining all of that. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you find it interesting, feel free to donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Help support the channel. Help us get more mind-shocking episodes out there, keeping up awareness not just in this missing persons and cold case, but in many others. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, make sure you allow our device to have those notifications come through, or you can just go to youtube.com slash mindshock or youtube.com slash mindshock true crime. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit that bell for notifications. You could also like and share this episode to keep up awareness. Awareness is how cases get solved by maintaining the case in public discussion and in the public eye. You could also check us out Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast, depending on your tier. Just check the link in the description. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right, so I'm going to start off with information that has come out, and this is from... This is from last year. It was published November 12th, 2020, foxnews.com. Jennifer Kessie disappearance. Newly released police photos suggest violent struggle. Kessie disappeared from her Orlando home in 2006 without a trace by Christina Corbin, Georine Tanner, Sid Upson. On a January evening in 2006, Jennifer Kessie chatted on the phone with her parents and boyfriend from inside her Orlando home before disappearing without a trace, stumping investigators and the young woman's family who have searched relentlessly for her from Florida to Mexico and Russia. Interesting. We did not cover the Russia angle. Now, nearly 15 years later, evidence photos obtained by Fox News suggest a violent struggle took place on the front hood of the 24-year-old woman's car, a clue the family hopes will yield new leads in a case that has long been unsolved. It looked like someone was thrown down on the top of the hood, Arms spread out and then dragged back almost like off the hood to the point where you can almost see fingers scribbling down the hood, said Kessie's father, Drew. The photos look suspicious and show what appears to be a hand mark going across the hood, added Mike Toretta, a former federal agent and private investigator hired by the Kessie family. We hope that by showing the public these photos, someone will come forward with information they've been holding on to for all these years, Toretta said. In 2018, Drew and Joyce Kessie sued the Orlando Police Department for all the records to date in their daughter's case. Frustrated by the police handling of the investigation, the family demanded the files be released to them in a legal battle that was unprecedented in a missing persons case. An agreement was reached and the Kessies in return received some 16,000 pages of records, which Fox News examines in its new true crime podcast, House of Broken Dreams, The Jennifer Kessie Story. Jennifer Kessie was last heard from at around 10 p.m. on January 23, 2006. She spoke by phone with her boyfriend, Rob Allen, who lived in Fort Lauderdale, 
Three hours away from Orlando, where Jennifer lived alone in a condominium at Mosaic at Millennia. On the morning of January 24th, 2006, Cassie failed to report to her job as a finance manager at a well-known timeshare company. Two days later, January 26th, Cassie's black Chevy Malibu was found abandoned at Huntington on the Green, an apartment complex in a high crime area about one mile away from her condo. Authorities soon uncovered surveillance video at that apartment complex showing an unknown person parking Cassie's car near the pool area at 12 noon, January 24th. The person of interest, believed to be male and dressed in workman's clothes, has never been identified. In every image captured by the surveillance camera, the person's face is obscured by the black bars of the fence. Within 24 hours, the Orlando Police Department employed NASA to enhance the images, but had little success. The FBI estimated the person to be between 5'3 and 5'5, with notably large feet for his height. And of course, that's been disputed as well, but we'll get to that later. This person holds the key to solving the case, said Toretta, a retired agent with the Drug Enforcement Agency who has been investigating Cassie's disappearance in 2017. Over the years, police questioned several people in connection with Cassie's disappearance, but no arrests have been made. In their examination of Cassie's vehicles, investigators uncovered a latent print belonging to the victim, as well as a large boot print near the gas pedal. In excerpts of police files obtained by Fox News, authorities immediately suspected a struggle on the hood of Cassie's car when they discovered the vehicle. Detective Julius Gauss of the Orlando Police Department wrote of police at the scene, quote, while observing the front of the victim's vehicles, these detectives observed what appeared to have been someone being pushed across the head of the vehicle, end quote. Is it common to call the hood the head of the vehicle? Unless this is a typo. Or he misspoke. A new witness speaking exclusively to Fox News claims she saw Cassie's black Chevy Malibu swerving near the exit to Mosaic at Millennia on the morning of January 24, 2006. The car was moving erratically, said the woman, who spoke on condition of anonymity to protect her identity. It looked as though two people were fighting over the steering wheel, she said. Now, I actually went over this in the first episode. And it's unclear whether she's saying it looked as two people were fighting over the steering wheel in terms of basing that on the movements of the vehicle, the car was moving erratically, or did she physically see two people or two shadows in the front seat fighting? It's not clear there. It looked as though, it doesn't state she saw two people fighting over the steering wheel. So it was basically the car moving erratically, which theoretically could have just been uh, a nervous individual swerving or driving in a panicked state either jennifer cassie herself possibly trying to get away from something or someone moving her vehicle because they were told to or someone directly involved with her disappearance and trying to make a getaway mosaic at millennia was undergoing a conversion from apartments to condominiums in january 2006 and construction workers were frequently on the property Workers were also allowed to live in vacant condos at Mosaic, according to law enforcement sources. The Kessies said their daughter felt uncomfortable around the maintenance workers employed by Mosaic. They would just stop and leer when they saw her, said Joyce Kessie. Whenever workers entered her apartment for painting and repairs, Jen was always on the phone with us, added Drew. She'd stay on the phone in the doorway of her condo until they had left. Nothing appeared out of place at Jennifer's condominium when her parent, when her family arrived at noon on January 24th to look for her. A damp towel was found near her shower and the unit was locked, suggesting the crime likely occurred after Kessie left home for work that morning. And I'm not sure about that either. We've discussed that again. I'll do a quick overview after reading this article. Cassie's purse, cell phone, iPod, and briefcase were missing from her condo. Based on his review of the facts, Toretta said he suspects Jennifer was accosted from behind as she locked her door and possibly forced into a vacant apartment across the hallway. She might not have had a chance to fight back, Toretta said. Whatever happened to Jennifer happened fast. Kessie worked as a finance manager at Central Florida Investments Timeshare Company, her second promotion in less than a year. 
Interesting. Enough to make others jealous, perhaps. She had purchased the condominium with her own money after graduating from the University of Central Florida with honors, an accomplishment she was proud of. She just lit up the room, Joyce Cassie said. Everyone loved being around Jen. The Cassies, who maintain a GoFundMe page for their investigation, said they will never give up searching until their daughter is recovered. We don't care when, we don't care how, and frankly, we don't care who. We just want our daughter back for the good or the bad, said her father. We miss her every day. So they also did not make mention, of course, of whoever knocked on her door that night. And that is very, very curious. I went over that in the first episode. Make sure you check that out. I'm not going to go through everything here again. But it's just curious. So in the hours leading up to the disappearance of a missing person, we have an unknown individual knocking on her door. Now, I don't know what kind of a coincidence theorist you'd have to be to, not, to ignore that. I mean, that's just bizarre. But let's, let's look at the, uh, the hood here and, and why I'm actually not quite so gung-ho about this as many other people are. Now, obviously, okay, there's a couple things that don't add up here. So it looks like something happened on the hood. But you really can't tell what. I mean, yes, yeah, sure, it could have been. It could have been someone sliding or pushed on the car. It, it could have been somebody putting a briefcase on it or, or whatever. I mean, it could have been workers doing something, sitting on it, moving food on it. I mean, again, I just, I don't see how anybody could say that this is definitive about anything. The other issue we have here is that law enforcement, for whatever reason, they believe that the car was wiped down and cleaned, possibly at a car wash, before the vehicle was abandoned. Now, for if it's that clean, why didn't they wipe down the hood? And if they didn't wipe down the hood, do we know when whatever happened on the hood, when that happened? Now, could that have also happened if the car was never cleaned, or at least the hood was never cleaned? Could that be from an incident a day before Jennifer Cassie's abduction and it has nothing to do with her abduction? Or could it have done could it have been done after the car was abandoned in this high crime area, people just hanging out on the hood? I'm assuming no, because the security footage should have seen it. Apparently there was another video camera that was even further. I'm not sure if I went over that on the previous episode, but apparently there was another camera. It pulls in and backs up and then pulls back in again. Whoever's driving the car stays in there for about 35 seconds. Then a ghostly figure emerges from Jennifer's car and calmly strolls away, as if on an afternoon walk. Another security camera, but it's even farther away, and supposedly you can't really tell much. Either way, I don't know, a lot of people made a really big deal about these newly released photos. Without direct proof that this is has something to do with the abduction, I'm not sure how useful that is. I mean, if we're really going through the gauntlet of possibilities here, is it possible someone else just got pushed on the car? Or let's say the uh, let's say these rambunctious condo workers, construction workers, they're pushing each other around, and and while they're walking down the sidewalk, one of them pushes them, and he sits on the hood, and then uses his hand to get up, or you know, they roughhouse. Who knows? I don't know how old these guys are. Some of them could be younger. So they could they could be roughhousing. I mean, again, just to, it just goes to show. We really don't have any direct information that this is 100% related to the abduction. And the fact that it was, that the law enforcement believed it was wiped down, possibly even cleaned at a car wash. Now, I don't know if they have other security footage that they haven't released to make them think it was at a car wash. Maybe it's really bad, grainy footage where you can't make out the driver. So it's kind of useless in terms of identifying the driver, but maybe they have it at a car wash. But if it was at a car wash, wouldn't the hood be cleaned? And if that's the case, does that mean that everything on the hood happened after it was parked and had nothing to do with Jennifer Cassie? I don't know. Again, this is mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure, and we examine everything logically and objectively. So supposedly this podcast, at least according to her father... 
has led to more tips, more clues, individuals that have never come forward before. So that all bodes well. So hopefully we can keep awareness up in the case and, and move it towards being solved. But there's so many issues here that we haven't even addressed yet. And I'm actually going to start with this very, very astute post on Reddit, Unsolved Mysteries, once again, one of the best subreddits for true crime and true crime discussion. And this was posted by Analog Dreams three years ago. Jennifer Cassidy's disappearance, weird things, and my own thoughts. Every few weeks or so, I get into a little rabbit hole regarding the case. Today, I was listening to the unconcluded podcast and reading some case info again, and I realized a few things I hadn't thought about before that seem weird to me now. Jennifer and her brother's friend's phones. And that's another issue, again, that her brother and her friends were at, uh, her brother and his friends happened to be staying at her apartment while she was on vacation. That's another thing that doesn't usually happen. Is it possibly there was some other criminal element involving construction workers in one of these individuals? And Jennifer Kessie somehow they thought she knew something she didn't know, or someone came to that apartment thinking that her brother or her or those friends were still there when they weren't. Now, if the person that knocked on our door that night left, and since nobody answered, they assumed the guys could have still been there, then they came back later at some point at night or in the morning. Either way, let me continue with this post here. Whoever abducted Jennifer took both of these phones. Whether they ran out of battery or the battery is taken out, which has never been and probably never will be verified, or they were powered down, most likely scenario. Otherwise, how would both phones die at the same time? And that's a good point. What's known for sure is that both phones are gone and have never been recovered. My question is why? Why take these phones that you have to keep powered off or dispose of in the first place? Why take both, first of all? Did the abductor think they were both Jennifers? Did the abductor know one wasn't because they actually knew Jennifer and took both to cause confusion? Was something on Jennifer's phone that could be traced back to them? A phone number would show up on the phone bill regardless, but something else saved on a phone like a picture wouldn't, not back then, not without the cloud. I'm just struggling to understand why the phones were taken in the first place. But this, just on another quick aside, if someone was after information on the friend's phone, they didn't know which one it was and Jennifer's collateral damage because if she saw them and they need that phone or they thought the brother's friends were there and now she sees the abductor's face or abductors, maybe there's more than one, it's, it's all very shady. But perhaps it wasn't her phone. Perhaps it was the friend's phone that these individuals were after. But anyway, continuing this post here, were both phones perhaps in Jennifer's purse or work bag because she was intending to ship her brother's friends back to him and went with her as she was abducted. That still doesn't care of, take care of the fact that the phones were both powered down around 10 the night before and apparently never powered back on. Something Jennifer wouldn't do according to her parents, which leads me to the next point. And before we get to the next point, I want to reiterate that. So Jennifer apparently would never power down her phone, but both phones were powered down 10 the night before. Now, I don't know how you can write off that information. To me, that is highly suspect, especially when you combine that with the fact of an unknown individual knocking on her door. I mean, these are things that just don't make sense, and to completely ignore them and only focus on the following morning, I mean, if you're doing an honest, objective, logical, neutral investigation, you have to examine all the available evidence, and that just jumps out as unusual. But let me continue the post here. The phones are telling us that something happened the night before, regardless of evidence pointing to a morning abduction. At or around 10 p.m. January 23rd, someone powered down these cell phones. And considering it was not in Jennifer's nature to cut herself off from contact, nor had she ever done that before, we have to assume it wasn't her. 
So if the phones were powered down the night before and Jennifer then abducted both phones going with her, the question changes. Did Jennifer's abduction start inside or outside her apartment? We are operating on the assumption that the phones were inside when powered down, which means her apartment was the primary crime scene and potential evidence left there is long gone. And again, I just don't want to overlook the possibility. Again, this is mind shock. I am not alleging it definitely took place the night before. I'm just saying it is not logical to completely ignore all of these anomalies and strange occurrences and just write them all off as coincidental and definitively having nothing to do with her abduction because, again, just looking at all missing persons cases, abductions, uh, premeditated abductions and or murders, things that stand out, things that deviate from normal routines, they're usually variables in something that happened that wasn't normal. Again, just basically, it stands to reason that. Now, yes, it's possible something else could have happened not related to the abduction that just so happened the night several hours before she was never seen again or never heard from again, approximate time of the last people speaking to her. It's a possibility. It just seems unlikely the fact that she was never seen again and all these anomalies stacked up prior. Continuing the post here, two, where is all of her stuff? Some things of Jennifer's went missing when she did and have never been recovered. In addition to her phone, her keys, purse, briefcase, iPod, and the outfit she was wearing have not been found to this day. Granted, Florida is a state full of lakes and swamps, and there are all sorts of ways to dispose stuff. But usually after some length of time in a case where a person goes missing with material items, the items eventually show up. Some of the items show up. Something that shows this person didn't just vanish off the face of the earth. But in this case, nothing. I guess the person who abducted her might have kept her things, but it just seems odd to me. And again, why take all this stuff in the first place? If the abduction happened between her apartment and the car with all the things she happened to have with her, that still doesn't explain the phones. Imagine Jennifer walking out to her car that morning, her keys, iPod phone, and a friend's phone to ship to him in her purse, purse and briefcase in hand, that all makes sense, except for this. Why is her phone still powered off? It doesn't make sense. And this poster still is not talking about whoever knocked on her door. Because again, I just cannot overlook that. Someone knocked on her door. This was explained away as a possible neighbor, but it just it doesn't make any sense. Someone knocks on her door, both phones are powered off, she's never seen again. It's just weird. Three, timing issues. If the person seen in the surveillance tape is also the person who abducted Jennifer and not a hired hand, what did he do with Jennifer or her body in the very small window of time between when she was known to be missing, 8 a.m., and the time her car was dropped off, 12 p.m., at the other apartment complex? If this person is the abductor, then they are parking Jennifer's car alone at 12 p.m. Where is Jennifer at this time? How likely is it that the abductor killed Jennifer in the first few hours of abducting her? Sadly, not that unlikely. Got rid of her body and parked her car all within four hours, all in the daylight during the week when things are busy, and also only got captured on surveillance one time. Was Jennifer hiding somewhere else until a later date? And if so, how did no one see or hear or notice anything in the secondary location ever? This is weird, though, because I, I mentioned this on the first episode. I'll mention it again. How is it possible that there's zero surveillance footage anywhere that d there's just zero surveillance that the individual that parked her car was just never seen again anywhere? Because they could cast a net of just, let's say, one or two miles out from the, from the, where the car was parked and just looking for someone, anybody, any individual that looks somewhat similar to the individual caught on the security footage. There's nothing, zero. Some people postulated the individual could have went to a bus stop, and if the bus stop was somewhat nearby that just happened to not have any security footage, they could have gone from the bus stop. But obviously, if they walked a mile or so, they should have been captured somewhere. But even if it was a bus, if you take the surrounding few blocks, you could still track where the bus could have went. Now, obviously, it does get a little tricky 
because but the, the the window of time is narrow enough i mean how many bus stops could have been in that area they could trace the route of the bus of all possible buses and all possible security footages to see who got off the bus where unless this individual happened to take a bus and not get off until where i mean what's the possible window i mean if you're doing a, a logical investigation you're gonna put in the man hours you could track i mean how many buses could there possibly have been from 12 onward unless you want to allege that individual knew someone maybe in a house nearby and they just went to that house and stayed in the house for a day then maybe but again you got to do the legwork four random thought an interesting thought occurred to me while typing this up what if jennifer's abduction did start the evening of the 23rd and she was and she also was at her apartment on the 24th getting ready for work what if both happened because the abduction started inside the apartment but she wasn't removed from the apartment until the morning imagine sometime around 10 pm the phones are powered down jennifer is kept in the apartment somehow no one is really around to hear her if she screams because the building is new and somewhat empty she's isolated her abductor keeps her there overnight and in the morning instructs her to get ready for work as usual maybe he lies to her to keep her calm and says he will take her to work or something who knows Maybe he says he has something against her company and wants money and she's his bargaining chip. I'm just wildly speculating here, but we really know nothing about motives, so literally anything could be possible. So she showers, gets ready, puts in her contacts, does her makeup. He says they're going to her work where he will set her free. He doesn't set her free. Okay, edit. I feel like I've heard so much conflicting information about the phones being powered off, but I want to amend this to say that we really don't know if this is true or not, as commenters have pointed out. From what I can find, there were probably two sources of this rumor. One, a CNN interview with Jennifer's boyfriend, in which he talks about her phone going to voicemail on the 24th. This could mean either it, sh it went straight to voicemail, which would indicate the phone was off or dead, or it just went to voicemail, as in she didn't answer. The boyfriend's discussion of this doesn't clarify, and two, up until at least 2014, the Kessies themselves said that police told them the phone ping stopped pinging at 10.40 p.m., indicating the phones were off. So the police first said this and then later changed their story on the phones, question mark. Yeah, it's it's unknown, of course, but it looks just, again, from all of this information, it's it's possible, unless further clarification and definitive evidence is provided, it's a possibility that both were powered off at the same time. And that's interesting because did the police, the police said that both the phones stopped at 1040? Huh. That's weird. So a comment here. Police never revealed to anyone, even the family, what time the phones were turned off went dead. I know there's a lot of speculation that they both powered down at 10.40 p.m. Monday night, but Joyce said on the second episode of the podcast that has never been confirmed, and law enforcement is keeping that information tight to the vest in hopes of getting a conviction one day. So, okay, so it seems like they could have been, and that might be related to the abduction, which is why the police don't want to talk about it. But then they're also saying the abduction happened in the morning on the way to the car. Like, what's going on here? Is this just sheer incompetence? Is there some police compl complicity and corruption going on and they're obfuscating and on purpose? I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And... So not all police files were turned over to the Kessies, which is curious because, I mean, they got a lot. But th this opens up a very interesting line of inquiry because if police department, I mean, friends and families of victims aren't going to live forever. If police have demonstrated that they're either incompetent or corrupt or for whatever other reason, they're just not thinking about it the right way. Maybe they're, com maybe they, they're completely above board. Maybe they are competent by most metrics but if for whatever reason they just can't solve it why not release it to the family so that they can get other private investigators or private investigation firms to attempt to solve the case because if, if police demonstrate that they're incapable of solving it for whatever reason i mean should there be a time frame and that's another issue i'm not really going to get into the whole government aspect of everything that's run by the government always is way less efficient and competent than the private sector. 
We don't need to get into that. But the point is, there's a lot of missing persons cases where police do not release the files. For example, more the Maura Murray case, many other cases. Is there a time window? I mean, how many decades need to pass of the police department demonstrating that they're either incompetent, corrupt, or simply just cannot solve it? So shouldn't there be other individuals that could at least try and bring some kind of justice and closure? I mean, I think that's a very valid discussion to have, and a lot of people don't even want to have it. The authority-worshipping cultists just believe it's all up to the police, leave it in the police's hands, despite the fact that on average, your, your murder is more likely to go unsolved than solved in most jurisdictions. I mean, the clearance rates are not good, not good at all. And uh, we all know all victims deserve justice. All families and friends deserve closure. I mean, why rob them of that? It's just, it's really strange how people defend the police behavior decade after decade in some of these unsolved cases. And again, even if they're completely above board and competent by every available metric, if they're just not looking at it the right way, there needs to be more creativity involved. They just need to release the files. I mean, it just comes down to that at a certain point. At a certain point, they should just release the files. Another response here, great. Right up, I think the question regarding the time the phones were powered down raises an interesting point. If she were abducted in the morning, I agree that it's odd her phone was not turned back on. From my own experience, I wouldn't turn my phone off like that, but if for whatever reason I did, I would want to turn it on as soon as I woke up to see if I missed calls, texts. What I've considered is if she went home and got ready to go out and meet someone, and the abduction started that night, but explains why her makeup would be out. I just have a gut feeling it happened that night, and the theory that she was taken in the morning has thrown off the timeline, made it harder to solve. And those are some valid points. Very valid points. Another commenter here said, maybe the phones weren't powered down at the same time. Simultaneous loss of contact could also occur if both phones were tossed in a body of water. Just a thought. And a very astute thought. That's a great point as well. Another response here, I strongly feel the phones played a part in what occurred. Perhaps the person responsible instructed Cassie to power off the phones that evening. This was 2006, so people were using Motorola razors and BlackBerry devices. I think we should keep in mind it was much more common to power off at the time, but the fact that both phones were disabled that night and never turned back on just seems very unusual given the events that followed, especially if... Everybody known to Cassie said she never powered off her own phone at night. Two, if she encountered trouble while on the way to her car, something would have to be done with her personal items. The car was left nearby at noon, but none of the items in question were inside. Another good point. Now, the counterpoint I have there, or the solution might have just been she was just thrown in a van. If she was taken in a van. And if this was a group of individuals, one of them could have been tasked with dumping the car or possibly an individual that had nothing to do with this crime and didn't know anything happened to Cassie, an individual, possibly a worker, possibly undocumented. If they threw him some extra cash, you know, Hey guy, just go, you know, move this car somewhere about a mile away. Don't ask any questions. They could have done it and they might've not even known who Cassie was. They just moved a car and would they admit that after the fact? Especially if they suspected that it was used in a crime and they were undocumented. Three, her body may have been kept somewhere temporarily until the person responsible could get rid of the car. It was left fairly close to Kessie's condo complex. Was that done in haste when their plan to put her car back in its normal spot was derailed? Interesting. So if there was some swerving for whatever reason, Kessie's car leaves the complex with or without Cassie, maybe they wanted to put it back and they couldn't for whatever reason. That is very interesting. For the lack of any discernible course of events is what seems to make this case interesting for a lot of people. I have always considered the possibility that she was held in her condo overnight by a person or persons who knew her, who knew she would be alone and isolated. I again go back to the situation with the phones as a possible source of more details about Kessie's disappearance. Another post here, original poster is right. The Kessies now say that the police never told them if or when the phones were powered off, but there was a quote 
on their website, apparently written by either one of Jennifer's parents or her brother, indicating that her phone was powered off the night before she was reported missing. So what's going on here? The person who wrote that on the family website was mistaken? Was it really a family member writing that or some misinformed person whom the family trusted took over the website to answer questions? Or maybe the police told them it was a bad idea to say that publicly and so they decided to retract that story. Or did the police make a mistake by thinking the phones were powered off and later told them they were mistaken? It's confusing. I doubt the unconcluded guys will ask the Cassies this question since they are so close to the family now, but there was definitely a post on the family's website indicating the phones were powered off the night before. So this comment was made by the Cassies or someone using their account on their guest book, July 24th, 2014. Jennifer.123guestbook.com, page 27, 7.23 a.m. We really don't want to start answering questions here on Guestbook. Otherwise, we will end up with hundreds of them. However, there are two cell phones still missing and never found. Jennifer's and an additional one left in her condo by a family friend staying at her condo while she was away. Jennifer was going to mail the second phone, presumably whenever she was able upon her return to Orlando, January 23rd, 2006. Those phones, we were told, were pinging a little after 10 p.m. on January 23rd, 2006, and went silent at approximately 10.40 p.m. by manual shutdown and presumed removal of cell batteries. Now that's quite specific. That is a very specific comment as if this was directly told to them by police. Manual shutdown and presumed removals of cell batteries. That's very, very specific and direct. The ping study was not an exact science then and gave us little the investigators can use i.e. one can't be in two places on the same phone miles away a few seconds apart. Just another heartbreaking reality of Jennifer's case. Technology isn't always cut and dry, which is another thorn in our side. So what you heard is true. And to this day, those cell phones, Jennifer's pocketbook, iPod, and her work attache are still not located, nor anything of hers that used that is trackable. The Kessies. So this was signed, The Kessies. Yeah, so they're saying we were told. Now, told by whom? The only people that they that would be in authority would be the police. So it seems the police, unless, again, either this really isn't the Cassies, would someone else posing as the Cassies be writing for them like an assistant? Maybe. But would they sign it, the Cassies? That seems kind of personal. Normally when somebody takes over an account, I mean, yeah, they'll post in the name, but they don't necessarily put personal touches on it unless it's some kind of celebrity thing where they really don't have time and they specifically hire someone to do that. But who knows? So it's either the Cassies themselves or an assistant saying the phone, they were told this by police, by manual shutdown and presumed removal of cell batteries. I mean, that is police speak. So yeah, either the police said they were mistaken or they think it wasn't a good idea to have that information public and they told the Kessies to backtrack that. Very, very interesting. So here is going to be a major, major mind shock. I don't believe I went over this on the first episode and it is just, it's just downright mind shocking. Are you guys ready? This might be one of the smoking guns here. A tracking dog tracked the abductor sent from the car dump site back to her apartment. What does this mean? So again, this is apparently they tracked the scent, her scent, or they tracked the scent from the vehicle. So whoever moved the vehicle past the entrance to a fence that cuts off the complex from the street. They went in the complex and the dog picked the scent back up. 
the dog went right to Jennifer's front door. So again, according to these Redditors discussing this, whoever abducted her went back sometime after dumping the car and before or after her brother showed up. And if he went back to the apartment, if the same individual went back to the apartment, see, this is what doesn't quite make sense because wouldn't he have been captured? How could there be zero CCTV footage between both locations a mile apart? So this is 2006. I mean, we're not talking the early 90s when there weren't that many, there wasn't that much footage. We're also not talking the middle of nowhere. I mean, this is Orlando, Orlando, Florida. As of 2015, it was the third most populous state with over 20 million people. I mean, there's a lot of businesses there. So again, it's just, it's really strange how they couldn't track this individual and they didn't show up anywhere else. And this, <laughs> this low rent crime ridden apartment complex, they have security footage, but nowhere else along any of this area or the, is there any security footage that was taken? I mean, it's really weird, but okay. Let's go back to the Reddit here. A response here. I have always wondered about the brother's friend. Is it possible he was still staying at the apartment and was surprised by Jennifer? That could explain the dog picking up the scent, i.e. the friend returned to the apartment to remove evidence of his still being there maybe forgetting the sweater or maybe he came back to get his phone and decided to take advantage of an attractive woman just getting out of the shower huh i would think that the police investigation would have checked him out but here's the thing they didn't even interview the construction workers because apparently this particular police department doesn't have a spanish translator <laughs> If you can believe that, that was the story they gave on why they didn't even interview any of the construction work. So did they check out the brother's friend? I mean, that is curious. Again, anything that doesn't match up is, uh, is curious. Some people disputed that dog scent and said that it tracked to the bottom of the stairs, not to Jennifer's condo's door, which is curious too. And of course, dog, I mean, dogs aren't a hundred percent perfect. So does that mean this was a construction worker and they just went back to the con apartment complex, but they didn't go directly to Jennifer's door? Or maybe they did and the scent had dissipated to the point where the dog didn't track it directly to the door. But either way, the, the, the dog tracked it back to the apartment complex. Very, very bizarre. Another good theory here, user since deleted, is there any way her car could have been tampered with to make it temporarily unusable in a simple way? Then maybe she was offered a lift from a construction worker, perhaps trusting that they have been working on the apartments for some time and it's public and broad daylight. Maybe another worker witnessed this and hasn't come forward through fear. Wanting to get to work on time, she accepts and is abducted. The abductor returns, fixes the car, then drives it to the location where it was found. Would that explain the car driving erratically if it was messed with? Huh. That is an interesting theory. Another very astute comment here. Could the abduction and car be two different crimes? Say she got ready, went down to the car and started it, forgot something, then got snatched on her way back to the car. Later, someone finds a running unlocked car and joyrides it for a couple hours, then dumps it at a place that's known for car theft. The POI could be clueless. He took a missing person's car. And I actually have not heard that theory before. That's really interesting. Another interesting post here. In 2016, local news reported that law enforcement was going to retest the DNA fiber found in Jennifer's car. No further information was ever provided on that. Interesting. Here's another thought-provoking post that also makes me think of the Maura Murray case and even the Delphi case. There are people who don't want this solved. When a basic timeline cannot be established, not even knowing what day it occurred, with modern forensics, are you kidding me, 
That tells a lot. Without a timeline, nothing is prosecuted. Someone is invested in not having this solved. A response here. After reading this thread, these are pretty much my thoughts. Either that or some colossal police incompetence. <laughs> of course, that makes me think of the Scott Peterson case, too. No timeline, no real evidence. Yet he's convicted somehow. Again, you can check out the Scott Peterson case series on Mindshuck. I cover that again. I'm not saying he's innocent, but there just seems to be no proof of his guilt. And you have police admitting to tampering evidence, removing information from police reports. Very, very damning. Another post here. Nothing about the car being moved makes sense to me other than it was Jennifer who drove it to meet someone on Monday night. I think the co-worker called her up, wanted to discuss the meeting scheduled for the next day or something more personal. Had Jennifer meet him somewhere, I would love to know if his wife was in town Monday night. I would love to know if she were in town if this co-worker told his wife he was working late or perhaps told her he had to go out of town. Could the wife have been the POI seen parking Jennifer's car? So in continuing with Jennifer Kessie's vehicle leaving that night, if she did go somewhere, there is an individual claiming to have seen Jennifer's car on the night of January 23rd. So we have this mind-shocking account of a woman who called in to the unconcluded podcast this was on the breadcrumbs episode august 14 2017 and she claims according to this audio here let's listen to it as far as i can remember is i lived on wingate drive in orlando not far from um jennifer kesty um one night i was um my children were little and we don't smoke in the house and I was excited. We were watching movies on cable. I got up to go outside to smoke a cigarette. It was dark. I can't remember the time. I noticed two cars outside. At this point, I didn't know about Jennifer Kessie yet. So I see two cars, and one of them spotted me and started flashing his lights into the woods. There's, like, a church there, and behind the church was, like, a wood. A bunch of trees look like the woods. But Oak Ridge, you know, we don't have woods. But anyway, he started flashing his lights, like warning somebody in, in those trees, in the woods. There was two cars there that night. One was Jennifer Cassie's at the time. Like I said, I didn't know it was her yet. And then next to her car was another vehicle that I couldn't see because her car first and then the other vehicle was beside her car. And since it was nighttime, I couldn't see. I got a look at the gentleman that was there, and he had a, he was a tall, slim guy with a ponytail. So I took the flyer down, and I came home, and I told my husband, I said, this was the car that was in the backyard. And he looked at it. So I called the hotline number. And they they didn't really do anything. The following day, they sent helicopters out. And that was the last I heard of it, about about that. But that was her car. Nobody ever approached me. Nobody. My husband at one point told me to mind my business because the guy looked over towards our house. And at the time, I had two small, you know, babies little ones. Mm -hmm. So I, I did call the hotline twice after I saw it, but never got a response back or nothing. And at one point, I had pulled over because I seen her mom, Jennifer Kessie's mom and father on John Young Parkway every weekend with their signs, help find Jennifer. And I had told them what happened and she just told me, call the hotline. And I did, but I never got anything. Nobody ever came to my door. Another, we moved since. But the guy was tall, he had a ponytail, and he was slim. And there was another person, but never got to look at the other person. Because he was flashing his lights into the woods like he was warning somebody. There was two cars there that night. Somebody had to have driven the other car. That was Jennifer's car. Okay. I am 100% positive that was her car. The only mm -hmm. thing that I have clear in my mind is that night when I saw the individual well, um, actually, when I opened my door, he looked over, went into the car, like not his whole body, but just to reach in to flash those headlights. 
And at that point, my husband told me, mind my business and shut the blinds. So I didn't get to see anybody else. The other car was behind her car? It was beside her car, not behind. It was beside. Like, it was Jennifer's car, and then right next to her car was another vehicle, but I couldn't see the other vehicle. I couldn't tell you the color, what kind of car it was, because it was beside it, because he looked over. So I turned on the porch light, my porch light in the back, not the the backyard. The light was off. I turned it on to go outside, but when I saw him look over and, you know, he was flashing his light, I went back inside to finish watching a movie we were watching. So she claims that she definitively saw Jennifer Kessie's car. She's very adamant. So she turned on her porch light, went to her patio to smoke, and then actually made eye contact with a Hispanic male with a ponytail. He then reached into the car and flashed the headlights presumably to an accomplice who drove the other car that was parked next to Jennifer Kessie's car. Now, this witness claims she couldn't really see the second car. There was a car there. She couldn't really make out much of the second car. So, again, let's look at these Google Earth images from 2006. So there's a church there just beyond her backyard with some wooded areas there. So late at night, would this be a good place to dump a body? I don't know. I don't know. But what's curious, what's very, very curious is that this podcast wanted to search it, but the church denied permission of the, of the search. And as per this witness, she said she was never interviewed. She called the hotline a couple times. Nobody came and interviewed her. She said apparently after the first time she called, there were helicopters sent out. I mean, I don't know what a helicopter would spot from way up high. I mean, this is a marshy, wooded area. If there was a body buried there, a helicopter definitely wouldn't see it. So I don't know uh, what the helicopters were there to do. But supposedly the area was never even searched. I mean, this is a bombshell tip. I mean, this woman is is adamant. Now, maybe she's wrong. I, again, I don't know how she could have told, I mean, Chevy, 2004 Chevy Malibus are not exactly rare vehicles. So a black Chevy Malibu, for whatever reason, this witness believes it was definitely her vehicle. Now, what's curious, what's curious is this church, less than two miles, so it's, uh, of the mosaic from Jennifer Kessie's apartment. Now, this is not where the Malibu was found. It was actually found directly about a mile east, Huntington on the Green condos, and that's where the CCTV is from. But and that's where the vehicle was put. But so these men, these a minimum of two men are here. It's not that far from Kessie's apartment, less than two miles. There's also, just looking at the map here, there seem to be some bodies of water here and some wooded areas right beyond there, too. Is this the easiest access to it, this church, late at night? Because all the other areas are around houses and condos, and coincidentally, the apartment complex, the, the club at Millennia. So the mosaic at Millennia is where... Cassie is, and there's also the club at Millennia very close to this location. Either way, there's a, it's a dense forest, marshy area. Is this a good place to dump a body? And if not for this witness who just wants to go out for a smoke, perhaps nobody would ever have uh, noticed this. So the church denied a search. Is that, is that suspect? Should a church be a little bit more uh, willing to help a family find closure, even if they don't believe anything is there? And how would they know if some criminals just went to the church grounds at night and dumped a body? Wouldn't the church want to find out anyway? I mean, I don't know. That's kind of weird. So some people theorize that that this uh, witness spooked them because she made eye contact with the Hispanic male with the ponytail. 
if she made eye contact with them, would they continue dumping the body? Because he flashed his lights after that. Does that mean let's get out of there? So was this a foiled plan to dump a body? And they didn't actually dump the body there. Either way, it was never searched. And someone posted here, it would have been nice if law enforcement followed up on these eyewitness accounts originally. The case probably would have been solved within days. Okay, now we will get to possibly the most mind-shocking testimony in the Jennifer Kessie case. Now, not too far from this church, and only uh, also less than two, two miles from the Mosaic at Millennia, is Northbridge on Millennia Lake apartment complexes. Okay. So this is fairly close to West Oak Ridge Road, where the church is. So all of this is occurring within uh, a relatively small area, under two miles or so, by car anyway. Now, there is a mind-shocking account by an Erica. Now, this is not her real name, of course, but she also was featured on this podcast, Unconcluded. And let's listen to her account. I had experienced um, something several years ago where um, uh, Jennifer Kessie actually came into my workplace. And that's how I'm pretty much, her story has stuck with me for 11 years. Basically, um, my husband and I were um, from Atlanta, and we had moved to um, Orlando, and we had been there for about a year. My husband wanted to, um, you know, continue his education, and I had gotten a job at an apartment community called Northbridge Apartments, um, actually Northbridge at Millennia Lakes. Northbridge was a new up-and-coming community, um, and uh, it, was, it was really awesome. Um, it was like one of those luxury communities, and they were kind of setting the trend with the retail stores um, at the bottom of the, the, you know, the apartments were up at the top, and the retail stores were at the bottom and stuff. And when I started working there, um, actually, the community was probably, like, probably at 20% ocu occupation, uh, or occupied, should I say. And so we definitely had a lot of uh, lease up to do. So um, we had a lot of people coming through there. I remember just it being extremely busy. It was it was really hard. There were some hard days working there because it was so busy. Anywhere from you know uh, fifty on an average, just fifty people coming into your office during the weekday. But on the weekend, you'd experience like a hundred, a hundred and thirty people um, coming in. So that was a lot of traffic. But anyway. Um, after I had been there for about a year, just on this random January day, a girl comes walking into the office, and and I asked if I could help her, and so I kind of motioned her to come over to my desk, and she sat down, and um, she was a really beautiful girl. Um, she was really striking. Her eyes especially was what caught me because she had really beautiful eyes, um, blonde hair. She was young. And um, I asked her, you know, uh, you know, what brought her to Northbridge? And she said, I'm looking for a one-bedroom apartment. And so I got out a guest card, and I was, you know, getting information. And I asked her her name, and she said, my name is Jennifer Kessie. And so I started writing down her name um, and all that stuff, just asking her questions, what, her, what she was looking for, what was her expected move-in day, and all that wonderful stuff. While I was asking her these questions, she was – completely distracted by something um behind me uh behind my my uh well behind me um the there were these huge windows that you could see outside to the entrance of the community and and all that stuff of the offices and so as I was talking to her she wasn't making eye contact with me she actually was just looking out the window like if she was looking for someone and she just she just was her attention span was just somewhere else and so i kept asking her questions you know just about 
what her likes are and, you know, does she have any pets and just things like that. And at this point, I, you know, about five minutes into asking her questions, I'm not getting, literally, I'm not getting anything back from her. I'm just kind of getting these random, just kind of um, short answers, but nothing that is, that is trying to help me help her to find a home because that's what I thought she came in there to do. And so she, at this point, I started getting really just kind of like, man, this girl, what is, what's, what's, what's up with this girl? She's just, she's not, she's, you know, obviously there's, she's not interested in an apartment. She's just wasting my time. So I asked her, do you want to look at, uh, do you want to look at a one bedroom? She said, no, no, I don't, I don't want to look at a one bedroom. But during this time, she, as I continued talking, it's almost like she let me continue to just keep asking her stuff. And she would give these short, you know, answers. She wouldn't really give any detail about anything. And she kept looking outside. And I was under the impression that she was – I. I I just I felt like she was in there wasting my time like she 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 came in there and she just was just you know biding her time about something I don't know what but at that point 10 minutes had already passed by and there was nothing else for us to talk about because she didn't want to see a one bedroom and so she asked me about something else and I don't recall what it was but it was I guess information like like an information packet and she would take it with her so at that moment um I, I just kept talking to her and I was just I just kept looking at her and I'm thinking okay she's 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 okay <laughs> I'm just gonna give her whatever information she wants and I'm just gonna let her go because you know she's just not not really interested maybe she's just wanting to just see something or just come in here and get some information and then just go and but something about her just was off and so anyway she got up and she left she took she apparently just took one thing with her from what I can recall um and it was just just one piece of paper but and she left and and I remember when I was sitting and when I was sitting there and I was writing her name I thought oh you know her name sounds like you know it's Kessie what you know that that's a, a nice last name kind of sounds like kisses or, or you know whatever and and that's why it, her name stuck out to me that's why it was just like it, it was memorable to me because of her last name and um but anyway and so basically you know after all after that after about 10 15 minutes of her being there you know she she left and that was it on that um and that was several days um before she actually disappeared it it had to have been um some sometime the week before she was abducted because that's that was the length of time and the thing was is that I wouldn't be surprised if she even came in because it was so long ago, but I wouldn't be surprised if she even came in on a Saturday, the, sat, the Saturday or the Sunday before. Because when I remember, I mean, we have, we had a lot of people coming into the office and our office was always packed, but it was extraordinarily packed on the day that she came in because we had people all over the place in the lobby and standing at, we had, we had at that time in our office, I want to say we had like eight leasing consultants. That's how busy Northbridge was. Um, and so I want to say it could have been, it could have been even that, that Saturday or that Sunday before. And I mean, because there were so many people there, but she came in, I want to say it was during the day. She came in anywhere between 1.30 and like 3 o'clock. And, yeah. So, and it was, I remember it was a beautiful, sunny day. And, yeah. Wednesday morning, that following week, Wednesday morning, I was getting ready for work. And I was, 
you know, of course, we live in Florida, so I was checking the weather because I was thinking, what am I going to wear for today? And, you know, what's the weather going to be like? So basically, I am looking at the, you know, the, the, the news, and all of a sudden, there's this picture of this girl that basically just, it just pops up on the screen and says, you know, missing. And there's this picture, and it all of a sudden, like, the screen flashes Jennifer Kessie. And I'm looking, at, and I'm I'm looking, and I'm thinking, this girl looks really familiar. Like I, I I was just stunned. I was just just stunned for like a minute. I just stood there and I just looked at her and looked at her, and I thought, surely not. Surely this can't be the same girl. And so I just I didn't know what to think. And so I hurried and I went down downstairs and I went down to the office. And I pulled the guest card, and sure enough, it said Jennifer Kessie, and it was her. And because I remember her eyes. I remember her. She had real pretty blonde hair, um, you know, shoulder-length hair. And I, she was very distinct. She was a very beautiful girl. So I, you know, I, you know, she had a look that was you could you would remember her by. So um, whenever I saw that, I, I was just actually – I was just really in shock. Like, I didn't really honestly know what to think. So um, I just sat there and I looked at the guest card and I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, I can't believe it. I I can't believe this girl is missing. She just came in and she talked to me and I, I just can't believe that this is her. And at that moment, I was thinking, what do I do? Do I take this guest card? You know, what what do I do? And so, I, you know, and I thought, no, I'll just I'll leave it. Because I, my heart was just beating 100 miles an hour, thinking, oh, my God, this girl's actually missing. And so I remember when I got off of work, like, it's all I could think about. When I got off of work, I remember going up to my bedroom and was just so nervous. And I called the the, the FBI crime line. And at this point, the news Everything in the news was about Jennifer Kessie, about her disappearance, and um, and her parents. Uh, I remember the news saying that her parents were at her house, they were at her place, and they were in the area. They were like they had already rallied up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to pass out flyers. I remember because I mean I lived like you know literally on the other side of Millennium Mall, which. Her house was on the front side of Millennium Mall. My house was on the back side of Millennium Mall. And um, I just I just remember just calling the crime line and telling them, this girl came in, this, is, this girl came into my office, sat at my desk, and was asking for a one-bedroom apartment, and she was sketched out. She was scared, and I just thought she was completely wasting my time because I was trying to talk to her. But she was somewhere else completely, and her eyes were just constantly just looking, like, like looking outside and trying to survey as if she, you know, as if she were, like, if she were looking for someone or, like, she was hiding. And while I was thinking all of these things and telling this to the crime line, like, all of these things started flooding back, how she was acting and and I was thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, just put put on your detective hat and, and think, you know, could she have just gone in there because someone, someone was following her? Um, maybe she was biding her time, um, something, you know, because she was obviously very frightened. And she, I mean, I, I, yeah, so anyway, going from there, there was a strange situation where um, outside of my apartment, and I, it was like Monday Monday evening. It was like late at night, and there was my husband and I. We were we had fallen asleep on our couch, and at that time, um, I lived in of course I lived in Northbridge, and I had this really um, cool apartment which was over the top of the um, of the entryway o- over the overpass, and the cars would actually drive underneath. Um, into the gate underneath my apartment. They would actually drive underneath my apartment. 
And my apartment was very long and it had large windows and it was next to the office. And my apartment would face the outside of, of the entrance of the community going towards Millennia Boulevard. And then when I turned around, I could see the, of the opposite direction, the other windows on the, on the other side of my apartment face the inside of the community. I can see the entire community from the other side. It was late, uh, like Monday evening. What I recall was that um, I, we had fallen asleep on the couch, and it was about 10:30, 11 o'clock at night. And I heard a female scream, like saying, "Help! Somebody, please help me!" And and I remember just some some talking outside, like almost like an agitated conversation going on between people, between like some people. Well, when I heard this female say, P- somebody, please help me, I immediately just, like, jumped up, and um, I ran over to my blinds, and I peered through the blinds, and I saw this this vehicle sitting, like, right next to the roundabout, and it was facing out, it was like, if it was like, it was facing in the direction as if it was leaving the community, and so there was this guy who takes this blonde-headed girl out of the front seat of this car, opens the back door. The girl is standing there in front of the um, back passenger uh, door, and she has her hand up almost like, you know, like, not like she's being arrested, but she's like, almost like she's like, her left hand is up, and she's almost just like having conversations like, I like, almost like she's saying to the person, I don't understand, or, 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 please stop or something like that. Her hand was up it with an expression as if she just didn't, you know, like understand the, the, the situation. So this guy is talking to her and he's talking to her in a way that it's almost like someone who's in a, in a relationship with someone who is sort of kind of in a, they're in a fight or borderline abusive relationship. But the guy grabs the girl by the neck. And he starts, like, talking to her, like, really close to her, to her face. And she's kind of cowering down just a, just a little bit, you know, because obviously he's, like, pushing her neck down, like, I guess trying to uh, maybe, like, assert his dominance over her. It just looked like she, like, she knew him. Like, it, it, like, it, it could have been an acquaintance or a friend that, that she pissed off and that um she was just like I- i'm sorry like you know i don't understand like okay okay uh I, this is you know and, and just basically what i could see was there was somebody else in the car but somebody else was sitting in the back seat on the opposite side and all i could see was somebody's like legs from their knees down and it was obviously a male because it wasn't it wasn't a female i could i could tell that this person had you know men's shoes on and obviously he, the person had black pants on um and black shoes um he puts her in the car and they peel out and take off and at this point like i told my husband i'm going to call the police because you know it's late at night and this girl's screaming for help and this guy's grabbing this girl by her neck and I call the police, the police officer comes out and he takes a statement and we tell him, you know, what had happened. We walked outside and said, this is where, this is what just happened. I just grabbed the car. It was a black car, um, four door and they peeled off and that was it. And I also let them know that on Monday night, there was a female that was outside of, um, of our community at the roundabout at about 11 o'clock at night and there was an altercation between this some person and uh, you know a guy and this girl and the girl had the same length hair the same color hair the same body build the look was literally exactly like jennifer um and i remember this this girl was wearing like she was she looked like she was getting ready for bed or something. Um, but she had sweatpants on and a tank top. I thought that was very odd. And I was thinking that they would 
the crime line FBI, because they're FBI, would put two and two together and would actually, you know, investigate more. Nobody ever asked, nobody ever called, nobody, nothing, nobody ever inquired about it or contacted me just to even ask um, anything further about it, which I thought was absolutely insane, um, considering that it was just, you know, it was an abduction case or, you know, this is like a big deal. This person just went missing and all of, you know, that's all that's being, you know, spoken about on the news and basically all of Orlando is in, in, in an uproar because this, you know, young, beautiful girl has gone missing. So, um, and that was, you know, that was pretty much, you know, what had happened. And I didn't realize until several months later, because there were the investigation, it was continuing on. And there were all these, you know, at that time, too, like the crazies were coming out. And you had thousands of people call on the FBI crime line and were saying that they had seen her here or or just all sorts of stuff. And when I, I remember when I was speaking to the person, um, it was a woman and I remember speaking to her when I called the crime line and she was just as bored and as nonchalant as could, as you could possibly be. And I, I felt like, are you, I felt like, like lady are you listening to me are you listening to what i'm telling you this girl came into my came into my office i and something was wrong and then this situation happens outside of my apartment don't you think that maybe she might have known somebody that lived there and it was just like their their questions that they asked me were just very vague their their um their reaction towards asking me the questions and responding was just vague and uninterested. It was almost like, you know, I, like they were taking an order of French fries at McDonald's and they just could care less. Um, which really, honestly, just really pissed me off. This guy was, um, just, he was as tall as her, just maybe like, almost eye to eye, but maybe just about an inch or two taller than she was. And he had dark hair, either black or very dark brown. And he had, he had light skin. He looked like he could have been Hispanic. Not like a Hispanic, like, like, um, a, like a, you know, a tan Puerto Rican or, um, you know, Dominican or he could, he looked like he could have been a cu- Cuban or he, he looked like he could have been, because Cubans have like um can have very light colored skin um well of course any Hispanic can but he looked Hispanic but he didn't he had very light fair skin What did his hairstyle look like did you see that at all His hairstyle Sean looked like the very same image that I showed you very same and I'm not I'm, mm-hmm. and I'm not trying to say that this is that person because you know I don't know who that person is and I'm, I don't want to say that but I'm telling you when I saw that I fixated on that and I was like oh my god like who is this person and why is it that he his he looks his, his just his face looks like that person that was out there that night grabbing her grabbing her neck so this is really mind shocking. So Erica seems very confident that she saw Jennifer Kessie not only that same night, January 23rd between 10:30 p.m. and 11 p.m. when she was woken up, woken up, she was sleeping on a sofa, she was woken up by a woman screaming for help. She jumped to the window, blonde female who looked like Jennifer was apparently being abducted by a light-skinned Hispanic male in the well-lit turnabout just below her second-story apartment. I mean, this is just absolutely mind-shocking. And before we continue analyzing that, what is even more mind-shocking, of course, is that supposedly this, this same individual 
interacted with Jennifer Cassidy, who showed up s supposedly sketched out and scared. So this was 10 days prior. So this would have been the January 13th, 2006. And of course, what else was going on in Jennifer Kessie's life at that time? So let's look at the timeline here. Jennifer moved into the condo, Mosaic at Millennia, Thursday, November 24th, 2005. On Wednesday, January 18th, 2006, Jennifer drives from Orlando to Fort Lauderdale, three-hour drive to her boyfriend Rob's place. And on Thursday, January 19th, 2006, in the morning, they fly to St. Croix to vacation along with a friend and that friend's family. Jennifer had left her car at Rob's place. Now... What's curious here, of course, her brother Logan uses her condo supposedly from Friday, January 20th. And this is Logan's best friend, Travis, and also Matt, who happens to be Jennifer's ex-boyfriend. And they stay the weekend. Travis accidentally leaves his cell phone there. Interesting. Was there altercation? Was there some other issue? But anyway, here's the point. What facilitated this vacation? How long did this how long was this vacation planned? And is if Erica is to be believed on January 13th, so this would be five days prior to Jennifer driving. So this on the 18th she drove. So this would have been the 13th, so a couple days before she's going on vacation. Erica here is claiming that she came into the office sort of inquiring about an apartment, but distracted, looking out the window, not really seeming interested in the apartment, and refusing to even see a model unit. So the impression here is that Jennifer was in Erica's office to avoid someone either following her or something to that extent. Erica seems to really believe it was Jennifer because she wrote down her full name in a log. Now, I don't know if this has ever been confirmed or located, which is another issue. Now, the most mind-shocking information here, of course, is the night of January 23rd, 2006, between 10.30 and 11, is when Erica supposedly witnesses Jennifer Cassie being abducted. She calls the police, according to her claim. The police showed up took a report, that was that, and that's it. So it might have not been Jennifer Kessy, but again, if we're looking at this report uh, about the church, it's relatively close by. Were they dumping her car and what happened exactly? Coincidentally, both of these sightings take place on the night of January 23rd, which is also coincidentally when there's an issue with the phones. We don't know the exact issue, but supposedly they no longer were pinging. So something happened. So here's an interesting post on Facebook by a guy named Joe regarding this. If you discount Erica's second account because you think she could have been mistaken about it being Jennifer, you can't conclude that in the first account because Erica wrote down Jennifer Kessie's name in a follow-up log. In order to discount Erica's first account, you must conclude she is lying, which I agree is possible, but in my personal opinion seems very improbable. Some people have argued Erica was looking for attention, but in, keep in mind she didn't come to the podcast to give an interview. She was tracked down by online sleuths who brought her to the attention of the podcast hosts who convinced her to tell the story in the podcast. It's clear to me that Jennifer was in distress and hiding from somebody. I speculate she was at Northbridge to get a mani-pedi and or have her hair done before her vacation. It was her last day off before leaving for St. Croix when she spotted her nemesis and took refuge in Erica's leasing office to avoid a confrontation. If Erica is correct, whatever occurred at Northbridge that day was something Jennifer didn't feel comfortable sharing with her family, even though we know she was very close to her family and shared almost everything with them. In my view, whatever happened at Northbridge that day, assuming Erica's account is true, is almost certainly directly related to her abduction and disappearance. Please think about this account deeply and draw your own conclusions, and please keep in mind it's just my own personal theory, which includes speculation. 
I'm not even adamant that I am correct. Okay. So, yeah, this is really crazy. This is really, really crazy, especially the proximity to the other sighting. Are all these witnesses lying? I don't know. I don't know. Or are they all mistaken? And if they are mistaken, what exactly is going on? Who's being abducted? I mean, this is really crazy. So the other thing that's kind of crazy, of course, there's a rumor that the co-worker, again, check out the first episode, one of the main theories in the Jennifer Kessie case is, of course, a jealous co-worker harmed her. Supposedly this individual might have had a brother or nephew that lived at Northbridge. And was he involved with whatever happened to Jennifer Kessie? Is that a more likely theory than one of the workers at the Mosaic being responsible? So a lot of mind shocks here, especially regarding these sightings and these individuals that are connected with these sightings. It's just really crazy. Is it possible Jennifer Kessie did have some kind of relationship with someone at work that she'd never really disclosed to anybody? And she might have just told her dad that it was a guy that was interested in her. He told her to, lie to, to let him down gently or something over lunch. And there was more to this story than appeared on the surface. And there's also a lot of conflicting information regarding the co-worker and the manager. And which one really had... It's difficult to understand the situation there because they might be blaming each other as the one who was jealous of Jennifer or whatnot. Because if one of them is the guilty party and the other one wants to make it look like he's not guilty, he's going to point the finger. They're going to be pointing the figure at each other. So it's it's really, that's really, really bizarre. And it's, it's curious because we have three potentially independent situations which are both not normal. We have her work situation with possibly one or two individuals infatuated with her with jealous rage issues. We have the workers who apparently were in her apartment and made comments to her. She did not feel safe. And then we also have her brother and, and his friends, one of which was her ex-boyfriend, staying at her apartment right before she returns from her trip. And now if we add to the mix the fact that she was also looking for another apartment, I mean, possibly if that was really her by the Erica sighting. If it wasn't, that's still, we have three independent theories here. I mean, they're all problematic. Is it possible that two of them overlap? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's really weird. And then supposedly her ex-boyfriend is also drinking not far from her apartment that particular night. Uh, it's this is really tough this is really tough we have three independent theories here it's it's really weird now let's let's look at some more reddit posts here kessie had expressed discomfort and even fear about the construction workers and others in her building so she likely wouldn't have opened her door to one of them but a woman Perhaps she would have been more likely to open her door or talk with a woman, especially if that woman expressed fear or asked for help. I personally think that whoever was involved did it without her letting the person into her place and that it was someone who let themselves in if she was in fact taken from inside the condo building. This is based on the woman who was living in her development, renting a condo with her boyfriend at the time Jennifer Kessie lived there. One night, really late, 2 to 4 a.m., they heard keys trying to open the condo. They were freaked out but remained silent. Then, after it seemed the person left, they went to go find the manager to ask questions about it. The manager slash security person said they were probably realtors looking at condos, which makes no sense at all and is highly suspicious to me and rings a billion alarm bells to me. So a, what is going on here? So another person that lived in Jennifer Kessie's building is stating here that someone had keys trying to open their condo between 2 and 4 a.m. 
Then the person left. When they went to check with the manager, they were told that they were probably just realtors. Even though they're occupying the con, they're renting the condo themselves. They're in the middle of sleeping and the management comes up with the story that realtors wanted to check out the apartment between 2 to 4 a.m. without even checking if somebody was sleeping there. Does that make sense to anybody? A response here, I am a realtor and there's just no way. The manager is way off on that. We don't just have keys. We have to access the keys through a digital lockbox that collects our info and timestamps it digitally. Not to mention that we hardly ever show property at night. Lockboxes are defaulted to stop any access after 9 p.m. No realtor goes around using keys at night at random condos. We could lose our license. I'm licensed in Florida, by the way, so that's how it works here. I've heard that this manager got several reports from women in this complex complaining about the creepy construction maintenance people. The manager dropped the ball by not taking these women seriously. Response, oh, the realtor excuse was a blatant lie. The girl and her boyfriend knew that. The boyfriend got into an altercation with the manager about it. I'm not sure how he even came up with such an unreasonable dumb lie. I think the manager was a total idiot, potentially malicious to some extent, but I don't know how, and didn't care or pay attention to what any of the workers did below him. So it's very curious as to exactly who this manager was and all these other reports. I mean, all of this is just mind shocking, but how does this fit? Because there's it, it, it just strains plausibility that her coworker might be involved with the manager at her apartment complex in setting her up somehow, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So how does this account for the sightings of Jennifer Kesse or her vehicle on the night of Monday the 23rd? Are all these people lying? It's just, it's really hard to rectify this information. It's very, very mind tracking. Believe it or not, there is even more information to go over this is not even all of it. It's just, it's so mind shocking. And the reason this case is so strange is again, we have three supposedly independent theories and they, they're all so sketchy. It's impossible to write them off, but how can all three be related? It's, it's just, it's really weird. You don't see this in most missing persons cases, like only the most mind shocking ones again the Maura Murray case has a lot of this kind of stuff but with the Jennifer Kessie case it's still it's very unique in its own right just because of all of these avenues and now the Kessie family so her parents and brother apparently they moved into her apartment after she went missing and that was kind of their home base to help find her I mean supposedly things should have quieted down at that point the manager and the workers might have not uh been going into random people's apartments in the middle of the night when they know they have the family of a missing woman living there in the condo. But the whole thing just does not make a lot of sense. And it's just really, really bizarre. In the next episode, we'll be taking a look at possibly a fourth avenue and it's pretty extensive. I don't want to go into it now, so not to tease, but in the next episode, we'll be taking a look at a fourth avenue and more issues with her workplace that possibly connect to this fourth avenue. And this has nothing to do with her coworkers. So it's just, it, the, yeah, there, there's a lot here. And hopefully the case is moving. I mean, po podcasts are keeping it in the limelight and documentaries. So hopefully this case will be solved. Some people believe that law enforcement and even Jennifer Kessie's family know exactly who did it. But they're just keeping up a certain facade because they just can't release the information to compromise a prosecution. So they're kind of just doing what the police tell them in, in technically what is obfuscation, but it's to protect the case. And if that's the case, that's good. If they know exactly who did it, and for whatever reason, they don't have enough to, to secure the conviction, but somehow they know for sure, then that's perfectly fine. 
they should definitely continue with that. But if they don't know for sure, then that's an issue because how do you rectify all these independent theories? All the mind shockers out there, they can drop their own thoughts, theories, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind in the comment section. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal and help support the channel. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, like and share this podcast, keep the awareness up. You can also check us on Twitter, check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcaster requests. You can also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.
If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. You are listening to the Jennifer Cassie series. This is episode three, Chino. Our person of interest, who is one of the workers, and the strange circumstances surrounding Chino, the workers at the complex, as well as the management at the complex, and plenty more. I mean, there's no shortage of shadiness in this case. And this is Mindshock, where we do the most exhaustive, comprehensive deep dives and logical analyses, trying not to fall for any logical fallacies like all these other podcasts and documentaries. So we will continue further down the rabbit hole in the Jennifer Cassie case. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, find it interesting and informative, want to help support Mindshock, help us get more mind-shocking content out there, and keep up awareness in unsolved cold cases, missing persons cases, wrongful convictions, and more, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, like and share it, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon, on Patreon to get priority for case topic, logical analysis, go podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. So we have a lot to go over. I mean, this is another one of these head scratcher type cases where there are so many different rabbit holes. I mean, everything from the car situation, the security footage, whether or not the person of interest in the footage is even related into whatever whatever happened to Jennifer Cassie, because if the workers simply uh, told one some other worker that had nothing to do with Jennifer Cassie, might not even know who Jennifer Cassie is, if they just paid him some money to go park the car or something, no questions asked. Maybe they also deal drugs or involved in other criminal activities. So this is all par for the course. So this person of interest might have suspected, obviously, that there was something up, but they might have not been responsible for what actually happened to Jennifer Kessie if the workers were responsible. Now, there's some definitely unanswered questions regarding Chino. We're going to go over them again. I mean, I've touched upon them in the previous episodes. We just have so much to go over here. There's also... I mean, whenever something's out of the ordinary, I mean, that's something you, it's really hard to, to write off as definitely not being related whenever there's an anomaly or an inconsistency. So Jennifer Kessie's brother and his friends stayed at this apartment, uh, at, at her apartment here. I mean, this, this is a weird point. The brother, or w one of the brother's friends left his phone. Jennifer Kessie supposedly is mailing the phone back. I mean, if he was involved in something. I mean, it, it, there's just so many unanswered questions, unresolved avenues of investigation. I mean, an ex-boyfriend. I mean, all these sightings. I mean, there's just so much here. I mean... This is why the Jennifer Cassie case continues to be one of the most requested on Mindshock. And uh, we're covering so many different cases and we have so many different series going. I mean, it's, it's not always easy to release episodes in every single series in a timely fashion, but we do our best. So let's jump right in here. Let's just do another breakdown. This is from the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. New details about Jennifer Cassie from the Up and Vanished episode. By Powerful Divide, Jennifer Cassie, a 24-year-old finance manager, was abducted while leaving work on the morning of January 24, 2006. Allegedly, we've gone over the timeline issues. There's actually no definitive proof on exactly when she was abducted. There's so many inconsistencies, even in the timeline. Some believe it was the night before. Some believe it was anywhere in between the night and uh, the morning of. Jennifer's case was recently profiled on the Oxygen series Up and Vanished. Some brand new details and information was revealed during the episode, and it wasn't just a rehash of old information. This is going to be a long post. Here's the recap. Happenings before Jennifer disappeared. As we all know, Jennifer was, happy, was unhappy with the workers in her complex as they made her feel uncomfortable. A friend interviewed in the program stated that Jennifer did not like them doing maintenance in her condo and preferred them to do it when she was gone. A disturbing piece of information that I haven't read anywhere is that one of the reasons Jennifer was uncomfortable with the workers is because they would come to her apartment and do a half-assed job. 
Joyce Cassie, Jennifer's mother, stated the workers would periodically do paint touch-ups in one room instead of doing the complete condo as a means to come back. Now, that's kind of weird. If they just want to come back and harass her, that's one thing. But if she's not even there and they come back and do... T I mean, that's kind of weird. Okay. Two weeks before Jennifer's vacation to St. Croix, the workers returned to do more touch-up work while Jennifer was on the phone to her father. Drew advised Jennifer to give them a piece of Tupperware and have them put the paint in it so she could do it herself. Jennifer did that, and the workers argued with her saying that you can't do that because it would ruin the paint. Well, what do they care? It's her, it's her apartment. <laughs> the day Jennifer disappeared, former Orlando PD police detective Joel Wright was interviewed for the program. He stated he believes Jennifer woke up and got ready for work and likely made it down the stairs and probably made it to her car when she was abducted. He believes the abduction took place at approximately 7.30 a.m. Joel Wright stated he believes the abduction took place in the morning due to a tip he received on Thursday the day Jennifer's car was found. The tip came from people who lived across the street from Jennifer's condo complex. They reported to him that they believed they saw Jennifer's car on Tuesday morning driving erratically out of the complex sometime after 7.30 a.m. Again, let's reiterate, her car, not her. And they believe it was her car, not 100% sure. When Jennifer's brother arrived at her condo complex, he saw the workers parked in a white van right next to where Jennifer's parking spot was. When Logan knocked on the window, they ignored him completely and did not respond to him at all. Logan was able to speak with a guy named Ben, who was the head of maintenance. He reported he was very rude and sketchy. Another thing, too, if they abducted her right then and there, would they continue? Like, if she was in the van, I mean, that'd be really creepy if, if when Logan was knocking on the window, she was actually in the van. But if they really abducted her and she was in the van, like, why would they still be right next to her parking spot? I mean, that definitely points away from that theory. The investigation, when asked about the surveillance footage in the POI, former detective Joel Wright stated that he had a source that used to be a housekeeper in the condo complex. This housekeeper has never seen a photo of the POI before. When shown the photograph of the POI, the housekeeper replied, that looks like Chino. After receiving this information, Wright went back to his office and typed the word Chino into the tracking system and discovered that sure enough, a tip had come in from the first week of the investigation from someone saying that a person known as Chino is involved in Jennifer's disappearance. All right, let's reiterate this. So, a housekeeper said that looks like Chino. Now, also, a separate source who called in a tip reported that a person known as Chino is involved in Jennifer's disappearance. Now, here's another thing, too, that we don't really talk about. We need to talk about this more. How many false tips are called in by true perpetrators as red herrings? I mean, I actually might have to do a podcast just on that. Because, I mean, yeah, that, that could very well be the case as well. Let's not fall for false economies or any other logical fallacies. In order to find out who Chino... Oh, at the time of Jennifer's abduction, Chino was known to be living and working at Jennifer's condo complex. Chino wasn't interviewed until Joel considered him a suspect in 2008. Wow, so two plus years later. In order to find out who Chino was, Joel returned to the complex and shown one of the remaining workers a photograph and asked which one was Chino. The worker was able to pick Chino out right away. And again, are these workers cooperating with police? I mean, what does that mean? Are several of the workers not? Because some people believe that this was kind of, uh, this might have been a multiple person operation. Because if multiple workers routinely hassled Jennifer Cassie, if it wasn't just one guy making rude comments or po possibly a psychopath or serial killer, if it was, if they were these group type antics, some believe a group, more than one individual is responsible for whatever happened to Jennifer Cassie. The other thing that's kind of weird, why would they just randomly attack and kill her? Because, you know what I mean? Unless something got out of hand. If the teasing maybe possibly turned into some touching or something and she really resisted hard and things got crazy quick, maybe it was, an, maybe it was even an accident of some kind. But it, it does seem kind of weird that they would just randomly kidnap and kill her. 
Like, it's known she lives there. It's known they work there. Some of them are undocumented, whatever. So it does, I mean, th there are certain circumstances where it seems like, why would they run them do this? Whereas if it's just one or two of the workers who are possibly psychopaths, the other workers might want to help with the investigation, as they seem to be helping this police officer. So these are all things to keep in mind. Although, again, we just, we really can't forget that the police apparently did not have a Spanish translator on hand in Florida. <laughs> And so, so none of these people were interviewed day of, day after, you know, in the immediate aftermath, which is obviously a huge, huge mistake there. So this worker was able to pick Chino out right away. Wright discovered that Chino was known to be working with the head of maintenance, Ben, the worker that Logan had an argument with the morning Jennifer disappeared. All right, so now the plot thickens here because if the maintenance guy, Ben, is truly the responsible party, perhaps Chino isn't responsible, but he knows things about Ben, maybe. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of shady reporting happenings. If you haven't checked out the first two podcasts, make sure you check the first two episodes out. Apparently, people that lived in that complex reported that, like, someone was trying to enter their room in the middle of the night with the key, et cetera, et cetera. Not necessarily that it was Ben, but if the keys were just handed out to random workers. I mean, just a really shady complex and situation all around. Wright was able to speak with Ben and admitted that both he and Chino worked in Jennifer's condo the week before Jennifer went on her vacation. Now, why is he admitting this? If he's guilty, if he's guilty with or without Chino, would he say that to explain away any possible fingerprints or DNA in the condo? On the other hand, if he's innocent, well, if he's innocent, he might also lie about it because he doesn't want to be involved. Or if he's innocent and telling the truth. I mean, there's just, there, there's a lot of different situations for giving that answer, innocent or guilty. Joel Wright stated that Chino was once in prison for a sexual battery case involving a minor. Wright stated that the FBI gave Chino a polygraph and he passed with flying colors. Joel doesn't know where either of the men are right now. So Ben, so Chino moved on. That's not surprising. Random worker. Ben moved on like the head of maintenance moved on and they don't even, they can't track him. So what does everybody think of the new t details? Photograph of Chino. Close up of Chino. Okay. Some posts here, holy smokes, ignoring the witnesses recognizing the photo and identifying him, that explanation matches the facts we knew, not much, connects the disappearance to the only real suspect population, the construction workers at her complex, and gives a possible motive, anger, revenge, punishment, that's a huge revelation. I mean, what does everybody think, though? Is this Chino guy really, does he match this uh, individual, this POI parking the vehicle? And is Ben involved in this situation? Another post here, I cannot believe that a legitimate police department would fail to follow up an entire group of suspects, construction workers who previously harassed her and had access to her apartment, simply due to language issues. It's the main thing that jumps out at you when you review the evidence. Another post here, I live in Orlando. Anytime multiple units respond to a call, it is almost guaranteed one of them is bilingual. Hell, you can't throw a rock without hitting someone who speaks Spanish. It's just unbelievable to me that they had no resources for an interpreter. Here's another post. I mean, this is just mind shocking. Uh, you know, not just the resources, but a Spanish speaking officer or non uniformed employee. Do they just give up on all cases involving Spanish-speaking victims, witnesses, and suspects? This makes so little sense, especially since the victim's brother observed a work vehicle next to her parking space and spoke with workers who made him feel uncomfortable. I mean, that is a good point. I mean, do they just shrug anytime they, there's, <laughs> there's Spanish-speaking individuals involved in a case in Orlando? I mean, this is just... I mean... <laughs> You can't make, I mean, what do you make of that? You can't make anything of that. And even if they didn't have anybody there that day, like they can't send someone the next day. I mean, this, there, there's just, I don't know what to make of this. This, this is just so mind shocking. Just that one detail. Another post here. So over on the Jennifer Kessie sub, a lot of people seem to think it was an ex-boyfriend or, or co-worker. 
I have always thought it was one of the construction workers. My initial reaction when seeing the POI video was that it was a shorter Hispanic man wearing painters or construction clothes. With this new information, I am 95% convinced it was one or two workers together. Combined with Jennifer telling her family she was wary of the workers, this seems like the most likely conclusion. Another post here, did you notice he has a bicycle clip on his right ankle over his trouser leg? Very cool and arrogant how he walked away after what he's done the last three hours. Completely lack of feeling and a real psychopath, that's for sure. He looks only about 21 years old, which makes it even more creepy. And again, if he really did po pass that polygraph, he needs a brain fingerprint scan. I talk about this all the time. You can't fool the brain fingerprint scan. But if you're a psychopath or a sociopath, you might be able to fool the polygraph. Many people do. Another post, I'm of the camp that the killer laid in wait for Jennifer, snatched her, and did whatever he was going to do, came back and hired a worker to move her car for him. That way, the killer gets away from the scene as soon as possible while having someone else leave their DNA, skin, prints, etc. all over the car, even though supposedly the car was wiped down. Okay, so let's examine this. So if it was either Ben or some rich guy, co-worker, or some other ex-boyfriend, whoever... Are these construction workers, how much do these workers make, especially if they're undocumented? I mean, how much money do they make? If somebody slipped them 100 bucks, 200 bucks to move a car, would they, how much to not ask questions about a potential crime involved? Someone else posted this, a polygraph is about as useful as a tarot card reading. Some would argue that the tarot card readings are more useful. A very, very astute post here. Certain drugs, legally or illegally obtained, are known to help fool a polygraph, particularly anti-anxiety sedatives such as benzodiazepines and opiates. Police rarely actually perform a drug test before a polygraph exam is given, but rather ask the subject if they're on any medication or drugs. This isn't uncommon knowledge. It also makes sense on what those drugs do to your physiological anxiety fear response. It's also fairly easy to take some benzos and not appear under the influence. There are many examples of this, but one that you can watch is on a crime documentary, The Imposter on Netflix. An FBI agent recounts how a missing boy's mother, whom they had strong suspicions, knew more about the boy's fate. Past her initial poly exam, the agent was dumbfounded. She had it administered again shortly after. Again, the mother passed. The FBI agent suspected the mother was under the influence of a sedative or opiate as the mother had a long history of opiate abuse. The mother denied she was on anything. To test this theory, the agent waited a few hours to administer the polygraph a third and final time to ensure the drug effects would be worn off. Sure enough, this time, the mother failed miserably, but only on the question specifically regarding her knowledge of her son's disappearance and fate. She passed the standard control questions. So, yeah, interesting points there. And other people, again, point to the way he walked away from the parked car. Cool as a cucumber. And again, if he was just hired to move the car, that's also another possibility. Another good post here. Is there anything to support that Chino took and passed a polygraph? So, or is it just the word of right, the detective? Again, this is, I mean, do we trust, do we trust law enforcement in this case? Again, not necessarily that there's a conspiracy or cover-up, but incompetence seems to be a very real possibility. Another poster posted this, I want to know what that first tip was about. Why they thought this guy was involved right off the bat. Easy to say now with what we know, since they apparently hadn't shown the surveillance footage yet at the time. So somebody called in the tip that Chino was involved before the surveillance footage was released. Another solid post here. I wonder, this head of maintenance guy named Ben, was he given a polygraph test? I think it's telling that both Chino and him were working on Jennifer's condo before she went on vacation. Being the head of maintenance, is it possible he could have had a master key card to Jennifer's apartment? A response here, ha hands down, have always felt as though this is who did it. And Chino followed boss Ben's orders to drop the car. 
If Chino is living at the complex illegally, possibly undocumented, we don't have any of this information, I mean, he'd probably do whatever Ben said, right? Regardless of whether he had any knowledge of a crime. Someone posted that Chino was around 35 at the time of Jennifer's appearance. It's kind of weird. I mean, he definitely looks incredibly young. Another po poster posted this. There's an old Law & Order episode with a lady being killed in her flat because she complains about maintenance work being done. She is killed by the head of a maintenance team, and one of the guys working for him helps cover it up because he's afraid of being deported. I mean, that's, that's pretty eerie if that's what happened here. Again, this is mind shock where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. I am not alleging anything is true or untrue. Let's go over this article from CBSNews.com, July 10th, 2021, The Disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. More than 15 years after Jennifer Kessie vanished, her parents, Drew and Joyce Kessie, are leading the investigation into their daughter's case. January 2006, 24-year-old Jennifer Kessie had everything going for her. She had just moved into a condo in Orlando, Florida, and she purchased on her own. She was also recently promoted at her job where she worked as a project manager for a timeshare company. Jennifer's mother, Joyce Kessie, said she was just really happy. Long Distance Love Jennifer Kessie was a year into her long-distance relationship with her boyfriend, Rob Allen. She was in love, her mother Joyce said, although Rob lived about three hours away in Fort Lauderdale. The two of them would see each other every weekend. Weekend getaway. One week before Jennifer Kessie disappeared, she took a weekend trip to St. Croix with her boyfriend, Rob Allen. My best friend said to me after the trip, oh, you're in love and you just don't want to admit it, Allen said. A happy return home. On Monday, January 23rd, 2006, after she returned home from a trip, Jennifer Kessie called her mom that morning on her way to work. Jen shared every detail about the trip. Joyce Kessie said she was on a cloud. Later that afternoon, Jennifer also called her brother and her father. Jennifer's final phone call. Monday evening, January 23rd, 2006, at around 10 p.m., Jennifer Kessie spoke to Rob Allen on the phone, but the call did not go well. We had a disagreement, Alan said. The long distance was taking a toll on their relationship. That was the last time he would ever speak to Jennifer again. Vanished without a trace. On Tuesday, January 24, 2006, Jennifer Kessie's parents received a call that Jennifer didn't show up for work. They were immediately worried. Her cell phone that she had had since she was 16 years old went to voicemail for the first time. That is how we knew something horrendous had happened, Joyce Kessie said. Within minutes, the Kessies and their son Logan were on the road and headed to Jennifer's condo in Orlando, Florida. Everything looked normal. When the Kessies, who lived two hours away, arrived at Jennifer's condo, nothing seemed to be out of place. In fact, they said it looked like she had just been there. There was makeup all over the counter. The t-shirt that she had worn to bed was on the floor. The shower was wet in the corners, Joyce Kessie said. Her parents did notice, however, that Jennifer's phone, keys, and purse were missing. Media Blitz. By sundown, many of Jennifer Kessie's family and friends gathered at her condo and started to search for her. They stood on street corners while they held up missing signs and handed out flyers with Jennifer's photo. Later that night, when there was still no sign of her, police officially declared Jennifer missing. A crucial discovery. Two days! After Jennifer Kessie went missing, her black Chevy Malibu was found in another condo complex parking lot approximately one mile away from where she lived. You have that initial hope like we found the car, it's only going to be a matter of time before we find Jennifer, said Jennifer's boyfriend Rob Allen. But when detectives opened the trunk of the car, Jennifer wasn't there. Nothing had been stolen from the car and there was no evidence of a struggle. A break in the case. When detectives reviewed surveillance video from the complex where Jennifer Kessie's car was discovered they saw a person parking her car. At around noon on the day Jennifer went missing, the person drove into the parking lot, sat in the car for about 30 seconds, and then walked away. But when police tried to identify the phantom figure, they hit a roadblock. The surveillance video took a photo every three seconds, and each time the person's face was obstructed by a fence post. A possible lead. Jennifer Kessie's parents refused to give up. They immediately moved into Jennifer's condo to be close to the investigation. The Kessies told police that Jennifer had complained to them about the workers at the building who occasionally made her feel uncomfortable. In fact, some of them had done work in her condo one week before she disappeared. A theory of what happened. 
Six months after Jennifer Kessie disappeared, Detective Joel Wright became the lead investigator and developed a theory of what happened to her on January 24th, 2006. I believe Jennifer got ready for work. She showered, she got dressed, went out outside of her condo, locked the door on the way out, and made it as far as her, as her car. After that, I believe she was abducted, he said. I mean, isn't this, see, again, just going back, I mean, that's kind of bold of someone to abduct her. I mean, this isn't the middle of the night. I mean, there's people around. I mean, someone actually saw the vehicle swerving, allegedly. I mean, it's, it's kind of rough. It's rough. Two years gone. On the two-year anniversary of Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, her family and friends gathered on a street corner and held up signs, just as they had done the day Jennifer went up missing. We're a broken family, her father, Drew Kessie, said. She needs to come home to her family. A fresh look. Almost three years after Jennifer Kessie's disappearance, Detective Wright decided to take a fresh look at the case and interviewed people on audio tape. One of the people he spoke to was a former housekeeper at Jennifer's condo complex. When he showed the woman the security camera photo of the unidentified person, she told him it resembled a man she knew from the complex, known as Chino, because of his hair, clothing, and the way he walked. This was the first time Wright had ever heard of Chino. A new lead. Detective Wright learned that Chino used to live in another building at Jennifer Kessie's condo complex and was a former maintenance worker there. Chino was one of the workers who did some repairs in Jennifer's condo one week before she disappeared. Detective Wright also found an anonymous crime line tip that was reported during the first week of the investigation that suggested Chino might have been involved in Jennifer's disappearance. So, I mean, I brought up the possibility earlier that this could have been the true perpetrator trying to throw a red herring. It also could have been possibly uh, a neighbor in the complex or someone nearby who, who suspected Chino but didn't have any real evidence. They might have just thought Chino was a scumbag. But again, we don't have those exact details on why they uh, reported him. The interview. When Detective Wright found Chino, he was serving time for a statutory rape charge. On March 18, 2009, Wright interviewed Chino in prison and asked him about the time he worked in Jennifer's condo. Chino said Jennifer let him inside her condo. Everything was normal, Chino also told him. I don't have any idea what happened to her, he said. That day, Chino took a polygraph test and he passed. Frustrations mounting, in 2010, Detective Wright was reassigned, and as more time went by, the Kessies grew frustrated with the Orlando Police Department's investigation, or lack thereof. Ten years gone, in 2016, after ten years had passed since Jennifer disappeared, she was declared dead by the state of, by the state of Florida. That was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, Drew Kessie said, taking matters into their own hands. December 2018, the Kessies sued the Orlando Police Department for a copy of Jennifer's case files. After months of legal wrangling in March 2019, they all reached a settlement. The OPD handed over more than 16,000 pages of documents and 67 hours of video and audio tape to the Kessies. Under the agreement, the Orlando Police Department would no longer lead the investigation. And many, many are clamoring for the same thing to occur in the Moore Murray case. A new set of eyes. Michael Toretta is a private investigator who works for the Cassies. He says he learned some 10 months after Jennifer disappeared, a person was seen dumping a rolled up piece of carpet into a lake not far from where Jennifer lived. This tip was especially interesting to him because on the day Jennifer went missing, there were workers laying down carpet in the apartment across the hall from Jennifer's condo. Whoa, 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 that's a major mind shock. We mentioned this lake search before and this tip, but I don't recall this detail. The workers were laying down carpet right across the hall from Jennifer's condo. That makes it a lot more damning. Toretta says he knew he had to get this tip checked out. Dive team investigate. November 2019, local police came out with a dive team to search the lake where an eyewitness said the piece of carpet was dumped. The team spent two days searching, but they did not find anything. This is something that is haunting me, private investigator Michael Toretta said. Until we can find that carpet and see what's in it, we need to follow up on that particular lead. Okay, 
So this was a dive team, but it doesn't say what other technology was used. Because, I mean, and this was 2019. I mean, obviously, there's a certain amount of technology that's available in 2019, but a lot of it's highly expensive. Now, in 2022, I mean, again, we have Moore's Law. Technology gets cheaper to use as time goes by. So can they use, what can they use? Can they use some type of sonar, infrared related technologies to just cut through the, uh, the visibility in the water, the visibility issues in the water? Or can they just get way more divers out there? Because it's kind of weird. So either this person made up the tip or it's a real tip and someone did dump carpet in there. Now, how, how often do people dump carpet in a lake? So it says an eyewitness said a piece of carpet was dumped. Like, how big? Did it look like a rolled up body? Which is what, like, why would somebody dump a carpet in a freaking lake? You could take it to a landfill, the dump, wherever. Like, how often? Do, can, can we get a survey going? How often has any have people been seen dumping carpets or rolled up carpets in lakes? And why were they not able to find that piece of carpet? Because even if this has nothing to do with Jennifer Cassie, if it's a, maybe they dumped another person's body, I mean, who knows? Or there's no body at all. They just dumped a piece of carpet for some reason. But why are they not able to find the carpet? I mean, humans have, have reached a certain level of technological advancement. If there is carpet in that lake, why can't they find it? Also, I bring up uh, satellite technology all the time. Now, obviously, back in 2006, satellite surveillance coverage might have been a little bit more limited. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it should still have been uh, at a certain point. I mean, again, I've gone over this in previous episodes. Satellites, I mean, there were satellites... 50s, 60s, 70s, but the more advanced programs, I mean, 80s, 90s, I mean, they were going by the 2000s. I mean, they were going. I am sure there's some kind of satellite surveillance footage of the late. Was it during the daytime or at nighttime when it was dumped? It doesn't stay here. If it was during the daytime, they might have the person's vehicle that's dumping it. Even still, at the apartment complex, they might have captured some comings and goings. Developing a new theory. Michael Toretta has a new theory as to what he thinks might have happened to Jennifer Kessie on the day she vanished. Based on interviews with people who lived at the condo complex, he believes that up to 10 construction workers were living in an empty apartment just across from Jennifer's. He said it could have been one or more of these workers who abducted her. Okay. So major, major, major mind shock here. Because again, I don't believe we went over this detail. Obviously... We went over that construction workers lived in the building, et cetera, et cetera. They're right across from Jennifer. So the knock on the door the previous night, was that one of the construction workers and did this whole abduction scenario? Or was one of the abduction, one of the construction workers, did they make a pass at her? She rejected, things got out of hand. And maybe the construction worker just left and that's it. Then he got angry and later at night he came back again and this time things really got out of hand. I mean, I don't know, but again, if they'd been living there for quite some time, like what what happened to make to kind of cause this situation randomly? Cuz apparently they'd been living there for X amount of time and it was just some weird comments that made her uncomfortable. Like what would cause this escalation to to murder or possibly some kind of accident that led to death? Gone but not forgotten, the Cassies have dedicated more than 15 years of their lives to finding the truth about what happened to their daughter on the morning of January 24, 2006. The hole in our heart is forever until we have an answer, Joyce Cassie said. And now with the files in their possession, they are more determined than ever to keep their daughter's story alive. So I don't know if I went over this before, but apparently there were other abductions and kidnappings in the area. Although, I mean, years later, I mean, 2020 here, woman kidnapped from Orlando apartment complex parking garage, November 24th, 2020, WESH.com. A woman is kidnapped from her Orlando apartment complex parking garage and then driven hours away by her kidnapper before she escaped. According to an arrest report, Michael Lucas was charged kidnapping, sexual battery, carjacking, and false imprisonment. Police said the victim was grabbing things out of the back seat of her Mercedes Benz in the parking lot of the Aqua at Millennia Apartments at about 7 p.m. 
Sunday night when a man grabbed her from behind and told her he'd shoot her if she yelled. If you scream, I have a gun and I will shoot you, the man yelled according to the arrest report. According to the report, the woman said she was forced into her own car by the man. He took off driving while she was ordered to keep her head between her legs and sit in the passenger seat. The victim told police she eventually figured out they were near Sarasota based off a cell phone conversation the man had in the car. In Sarasota, the woman said that the man stopped at a business where she was able to partially see a sign that said, Dreads. The report said after stopping at the business, the woman said she was driven to an apartment and sexually battered. She told police she overheard another cell phone conversation in which the person on the other end of the phone was calling her kidnapper by the name Mike. While they were in Sarasota, the man then ordered the woman to get into the driver's seat and take them both back to Orlando. As they were approaching Orlando, the victim said her kidnapper had fallen asleep in the passenger seat of the car. She said she ran red lights because she feared that stopping would wake him up. She didn't stop until she got to the 7-Eleven at International Drive and Destination Parkway. She ran into the store, hid behind the counter, and called 911 as she told the store employee to lock the doors. The store employee said the kidnapper started banging on the doors while holding up the victim's purse, but eventually ran off. Wait, he thought she would open up to get her purse? What? Moments later, the Orange County Sheriff's Office was called to investigate a report of a suspicious person at Lockheed Martin. The man deputies found was Michael Lucas, who investigators said matched the description of the kidnapper. Investigators said Lucas was on probation in Sarasota, and his probation officer told investigators that he was not supposed to leave the county. So, again, this guy just seems like a weirdo and not very smart, but, and, you know, I don't know how anybody can connect this to the Kessie case, but the point is, I mean, there seem to be other cases like this, unfortunately. It's just really, really bizarre. And then Florida, of course, known for human trafficking. I mean, there's a lot of human trafficking that goes on in Florida. All right, so here's another post from the Jennifer Kessie subreddit with some more information that might be relatively damning against Chino. So this is by Marky Bug two years ago, Lake Scenario. If I have this correct, Chino falsely stated that when he was working in Jen's apartment, she told him to lock up. Drew was on the phone with Jen as she supervised them, and she did not say this. On the day she went missing, a man driving a pickup truck was witnessed dropping what appeared to be a six to eight foot rolled up carpet. Yeah, that, that's big. So is this during the day? We still don't know if it's during the daytime. So on the day, on the day she went missing, supposedly this was 10 days after, according to the other side. But either way, the questions are, did Chino drive a pickup? Did he stay in the apartment so he's living off-site but nearby? I think, especially as there are no other leads that need to do two things, drain the lake and search forensically. Re-interview Chino, either offer him immunity and maybe witness protection if he knows what happened but wasn't directly involved, or assume he's the POI and interview from that perspective. A few uh, posts by users since deleted. It's important to remember that Chino was an employee of the Mosaic Condo Association, one of two full-time maintenance workers. By all accounts, he was very friendly and had a good rapport with the inhabitants. He was not one of the contractors who were constantly in and out. These are the gentlemen whose work Jen wanted to witness in person. In my opinion, it's entirely possible that Jen would possibly let Chino in her condo alone and trust him to lock up after. Chino did not drive a pickup. He drove a suburban-type utility vehicle. Chino lived in the Mosaic Complex both before Jen's disappearance and for almost a year after. Not only did Chino pass a lie detector test, publicly agree to work closely with the Kessie family and its investigators, but that lake was also searched extensively. Yeah, someone posted this. Chino's personal vehicle was a large red SUV, but there was also a white or light-colored pickup truck that he and Ben used for maintenance work. He and his girlfriend lived at Mosaic on the third floor of a building on the east side of the complex. So is that, are they talking about Chino and his girlfriend or Ben and his girlfriend? It seems like they're talking about Chino here. Huh. Interesting information there. The other thing that's kind of damning, if it was one of the workers, because the Bloodhound, the do there was a dog track from 
Jennifer Kessie's car back to the condo. The It was actually a bloodhound named Bo. Bo tracked the scent in the driver's seat directly to the rear stairwell of Jennifer's apartment near a pond before losing the trace. So why would the guy, the driver of the vehicle, if this dog track is accurate, the driver of the vehicle who parked Cassie's car walked back to the apart to her apartment or that back area. I mean, I mean, if it wasn't a worker, it could still be somebody going back to clean up, maybe clean up and remove traces, their own traces possibly, but What's also interesting, someone dug this up on the Jennifer Kessie subreddit two years ago. A picture of Chino and a sex suspect in a sexual assault in 2005. This is a composite sketch of a rapist near Curry Ford Road, roughly 15 minutes away from Kessie's apartment. So how many other crimes, if this is the guy, like how many other crimes did he commit but he's also supposedly not a suspect or no longer a suspect in the Cassie case. Like, what's going on here? Because this, this guy seems to have a history of violence against women. And uh, the other, the other uh, charge was against a minor as well. So, I mean, this is not a good guy by, uh, if he's guilty of these crimes. I mean, there's so much weird... Some people are stating that the carpet wasn't dumped until November 2006. And Chino supposedly moved in two, November 2006. So if that's true, I mean, how much later was the carpet dumped? Mean, why is there so much... Why can we not find out when exactly the carpet was dumped? Hmm. If it's true... If it's true that he moved right after the dumping of the carpet, I mean, that's kind of crazy. Okay, some more information on Chino. This is from uh, the House of Dreams podcast, or House of Broken Dreams podcast. Housekeeper from the Mosaic watched the POI video with the police, said that Chino. Police then realized that another anonymous lead on Chino that was initially overlooked. Another woman who lived at the Mosaic was interviewed on the House of Broken Dreams podcast and said, or House of Dreams podcast, and said it looked like Chino to her too. He was a maintenance man at the Mosaic at the time of Jen's disappearance. The woman on the podcast described him as creepy, knocking on the doors of single women at the Mosaic late at night to see how they were doing, to chat, etc. He would also be seen roaming the property in the middle of the night, i.e. 4 a.m., on a regular basis. He was in Jen's apartment painting approximately one week before she disappeared. He maintains his innocence and was interviewed on the recent 48 Hours episode, also past the polygraph. Okay, all right. The coincidence stack is getting high. So another woman at the complex is stating here that he routinely walked around and knocked on single women's doors. So was that really him knocking on the door when Jen was on the phone the night before? He also supposedly was known to roam the property at 4 a.m. on a regular basis. And now we have this additional sketch of a rape suspect who just happens to look exactly like him. Wow. Wow. I mean, this is a lot. This is a lot. Now, on these recent episodes, I mean, they have them in the 48 Hours episode, and... Okay, so apparently they know where he is now, and he continues to maintain his innocence. Again, no news on the Ben guy, the, the maintenance manager guy. So, someone else posted this. Uh, Jennifer Kessie's father said he does not consider Chino to be a POI, but believes he might have some information that could help. What does that mean? What the heck does that mean? That he knows the other workers at the complex, if the workers are responsible, and he could provide a list, maybe, even of the undocumented ones, if there were undocumented ones. So what does everybody make of Chino and Ben and their possible involvement or possible knowledge? And is Ben still missing? So Chino, they've located. He still maintains his innocence. He's still doing interviews. But uh, what about Ben? 
And is there a connection with Ben? There's also a pickup truck that they both supposedly used. I mean, there's a lot of circumstantial possible coincidences here. Obviously nothing concrete in any way. But it is quite bizarre. I think a brain fingerprint scan is in order, and they really do need to track down Ben, give him a brain fingerprint scan. I think if they really brain fingerprint scanned all these individuals, uh, this, this case could get solved. This case could definitely get solved. Plenty more to come. I mean, this there's a lot of rabbit holes in this case. It's a deep one. Uh, we do have a number of episodes coming in this case to unravel this mystery that is the Jennifer Kessie case and hopefully get some kind of conclusion, closure. And, you know, this, this is just a lot of these missing persons cases. They just go on for far too long when supposedly if proper investigation was done, th this, the case should have been closed quite uh, close to the time that it occurred. Hope you guys found another edition of Mind Shock True Crime interesting and informative. If you want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Help support the channel that way. Get access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Like and share. Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind. Leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.